Welcome to a special session of the Nevada Irrigation District Board of Directors. Uh, today, February 8th, 2022. If you'll uh, try to keep those I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you all. Madam Secretary, will you call the roll? Yes, Division 1. Oh, here. Division 2. Here. Division 3. Here. Division 4. Here. Division 5. Here. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to our fourth planning uh, for water meeting, and before that we will have a administrative update as we have been in the past for the first hour of the time search for the uh, plan for water at four o'clock. And just a reminder, these are information this will be an informational meeting only, there's no action taken today. And if you want to comment or ask a question at any time during either presentation. Phone and we'll just let you jump right in. So with that, I think we're ready to begin with Yeah. Greg is going to be taking the honors. Okay. Welcome back, Greg. Glad Thank you very here. much. Yes. Thanks for having me and uh, glad to be back. Okay. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, so tonight we'll give a quick uh, overview of the administrative um, administration department overall, and um, that's uh, as you can see in your packet. It entails one, two, three, four, five different budgetary areas of departments, and um, most of it uh, we'll, we'll go through it here in a second. Management, environmental resources, information technology, communications, and safety. So feel free to ask questions as I move through. I do have a couple staff trying to oh, oh darn, went too fast. I do have a couple staff members on the line. If we have some technical questions that are outside of my level of expertise, we'll call them in. But uh, most of them we should probably be able to handle pretty well. So overall, the administrative services departments are groups of related activities and resources that support the overall district obligations. We sort of live within this new Fund 70 that we created this year, which is um, um, our internal services. So there are a number of other uh, departments within the internal services Fund 70, but uh, five of them are contained within the administrative realm. And so um, they're listed here amongst us on the presentation and on the screen. Um, they entail the management um, side of the house, uh, which is a 2022 budget of $3.7 million and a fiscal year 2022 uh, FTE of 5.75 staff. Um, the Environmental Resources Department, which is a uh, budget line item of $2.39 million with two staff, and we'll get into the staff in a little bit more as we go through. This is an overview. Uh, the Information Technology, uh, roughly $1.4 million dollars uh, with um, three full-time staff members. Uh, the safety department, budget of 355000 with two full-time staff members and our communications uh, staff, which is uh, one staff member at $239,000. Um, yeah. Before we leave the numbers, uh, yeah. can you for the benefit of board members and, and the public who may want to be understand a little bit better that these numbers of, of uh, budget numbers divided by the staff does not equal the staff salaries that there are other numbers in there oh absolutely because when you do that it's it's not good yeah no fair enough good good good, good, that's for sure. good point good point um so within within these budget numbers they are broken up into a m many different types of uh expense line items. Okay. So inclusive of things like um, materials, um, things like consultant fees, such as legal fees, which is a heavy load in the management budget. Um, uh, insurance is carried a lot in the management budget. And so 
uh, contractor fees, heavy load in the environmental resources that was department. Be my question right right? There. Yeah, yeah. Uh, materials, like I said, um, IT, we've got a number of materials and equipment that we have to purchase every year. So that's entailed within each one of these budgets. Um, it is not reflective of staff member divided by, or the budget divided by the staff member um, equals the total salary for that, that unit. But you can see how someone might draw that conclusion. Sure. Okay. okay. And, but thank you for clarifying for us. Yeah. Everybody. No, I appreciate that. I didn't think about that, but that is, uh, that would be a, 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 uh, an, a bad conclusion to to make. Yeah. Yes. Can I ask another question, yeah. Greg? Um, I I know from talking to Jennifer that HR is not included in this mm -hmm. grouping, the administrative group. Mm -hmm. When we allocated overhead to hydro, rec, and water, how did we did we integrate the cost of HR and or other administrative functions? I mean, so it, I mean, it's not part of administration, but where does it show up in the yeah, allocation it's methodology? It, it's still fund seventy. It's a little bit of a difference between kind of the funding of the departments versus the organizational chart. Yeah, HR under our current organizational chart is its own separate department, but it is a fund seventy okay. item. Okay, thank you. Yeah, as well as just you, you haven't seen. Um, um, shop operations and purchasing, mm -hmm. they're within Fund 70 as well, but they're just not entailed in this particular presentation. Okay. Finance as well. And are um, costs such as office space and phone system and general things like that also included in this, this these numbers, or is that a separate? You know, it is. It's all the operational yeah. costs, so it depends on the specific cost, whether it's directly allocated or if it's cost allocated, some things lend yeah. themselves more to being directly uh, allocated. Jennifer, can you back up? For the purpose of this particular um, budget, and we did, as you'll recall, we simplified the cost allocation to some extent. So for the most part, yes, buildings, phones, those things are cost allocated. Okay. Unless it made more sense to directly allocate it. Okay. Yeah. The cost allocation formula wasn't fair for some reason. Okay. So going to Ricky's point that that's going to be in that these numbers as well. Yeah, those include salaries plus operations. Yeah. And then in the case of environmental resources, um, I believe you're also seeing a couple of capital projects rolled in there as well. Yeah. Thank you. Contractor fees, etc. And okay. salary includes Benefits, retirement. Yep. Yep. It's from the budget. OPEB. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So in the management side of it, the 5.75 um, staff members, we've got uh, General Manager Hanson, myself, Chris Tapanian, Board Secretary, Kate Gunther, and Katie Kemp uh, in our records division, records department. Um, and then uh, we do have a vacant uh, part-time position as an office assistant. So, uh, that is vacant at the moment. So this staff consists of sort of district-wide functions, um, overall organizational and business administration, um, running, managing, maintaining, organizing committee meetings and board meetings such as these, uh, policy resolution administration, you can read the list, legal administration, risk management, insurance and claims, um, management of our public records acts and uh, Brown Act um, considerations, uh, labor negotiations, strategic and long-term planning and oversight, coordination with other departments, ensuring that uh, all other departments are, are, are functioning and coordinating, external public agency coordination, Jennifer, myself, other management staff as well, but go to different organizations and entities to give presentations. So this is just a high-level overview, you know, kind of the all duties is a sign that we like to say. but. Um, this is a lot of what the management side of the functionality consists of. So the environmental resources. Uh, this is a program area that has really taken off in the last, I'd say, six years of NID. Um, I think it was six years ago that NASA King, um, our environmental resources administrator, was first hired on to the district, and uh, we are extremely thankful to have her on our side of the ledger. Um, 
over the last year and a half, I believe it has been, um, Cameron Townsend came into the department as well as the uh, technician. He came in from a program called Civic Spark that we'll talk about in just a little bit, but um, we've been thankful to have both of them running what we're terming our environmental resources, and it really is this large sort of esoteric review and, and overview of all of our properties that we have, that we have control of and ownership of um, in terms of large science-based research methods, analytical uh, development of the watershed lands that we own. And so they administer all of the contracts uh, that are done in cooperation with contractors, different um, uh, forestry professionals uh, in the field, constantly in the field working on, on those projects. They work in coordination with our maintenance operations department. They'll talk about trees, all things trees. They are a good resource for us when we do different CEQA documents and some grant activity work as well. Um, we've got a little uh, blurb that uh, we've put together, right, recognizing that the productive and healthy watersheds provide vital um, water vital for our consumption, um, aquatic and the terrestrial ecosystems that we uh, must manage within our care. Um, we do depend on a lot of cooperation and collaboration with other departments around the district. We work with not only our, our partners within the, the, the district, um, operations, maintenance, the safety department, communications, others, uh, hydro, but we also work uh, with other agencies and organizations. So there are numerous local or collaborative groups that are put together um, and we participate with county, the county OES, uh, both Placer, Nevada, uh, and different organizational entities talking about forest management practice, best practices, um, aquatic ecosystems, restoration of meadow shed, meadows, etc. So this is a, uh, a little overview of what um, both Cameron and Mesa work on on a daily basis. Here's some accomplishments that they uh, worked on in 2021. Um, the first bullet point is a CAL FIRE CFIP, and that is a, a grant program. It's a 75% reimbursable grant program that we've been sort of recurring over the last three or four years and have become really great partners with and for CAL FIRE in terms of fire man forestry management on many of the acres uh, that we own up in the upper watersheds and the WUI, the wildland urban interface, um, uh, and then the large, the large uh, uh, watershed lands that we do own that are a little outside of, of WUI areas. But uh, this particular one was um, Rollins Reservoir uh, fire, fuels fire Fuels Reduction Project. So this was 103 acres at Long Ravine and Orchard Springs. So we worked within the campgrounds. Um, working closely with Monica and her team. Um, we help them as well with uh, fire or forestry needs, um, talking about hazard trees. So we're worried a lot about um, campers coming to the area and making sure that every spring that we clear out as many hazard trees as we can. And unfortunately, every year it's getting worse and worse. So we go in a couple different times throughout the year and try to clear out as many um, trees as we possibly can through mastication, hand crews, um, hazard limb removal. There's a number of contractors in the local area that we work with. Uh, some of them are uh, absolutely not available at certain times of year. They're on a fire, they're somewhere else. Other crews are available. There's some really great crews that we work with. Um, uh, some are more specialized in certain ways and some are more general in other ways, but we tend to have a really great opportunity to work with a lot of different local firms on a lot of these forestry projects. Are the trees dying because of uh, the beetle or are they dying because of, I mean, I know the drought and the beetles are integrated, Yeah. but is it, are the trees we're taking down show signs of the beetle infestation? There are definitely parts. Long Ravine had a large beetle infestation that we would go, but we would go in and spend a month clearing out trees and then two months later we come back and there's a whole section of trees that are dead and they come on fast. So yeah, it's it's a lot of both and the beetle does 
um, does tend to gravitate towards stress trees that mm -hmm. have a lot of drought consideration to it. Yeah. So it does go hand in hand. It's not everywhere that there is a there is an outbreak of beetle um, kill, but where we do see it, we try to get to it immediately and as quick as as we possibly can, yeah. so it doesn't spread to the other trees. Yeah. Do we ever, or is there any funding available to do preventative inoculation of the trees? I'm not sure what you mean by that. There's, there's an inoculation. Hi, Nasa. This is a great Hello, time everybody. for you. Uh, Hi, this Nasa. is a great conversation. Hello, everybody. Um, I would love to jump in because the questions I think are right on right on point around forest health and beetles. Beetles are present throughout the Sierra. We've certainly seen pockets where they are killing the trees. But what we're doing here, if you look at these two photos where we've thinned out the forest stand, if you want to call it yeah. a stand of trees, we're reducing the competition. So whether you're looking at the top photo where you see a lot of understory and density or the bottom photo, the bottom photo, those trees that have remained after we've gone in and used mastication, to ba it's basically a, a track piece of equipment with a grinder on it that grinds them up. And we take out the understory, which would be the ladder fuel that would bring a fire up from the ground up to the canopy. But also we're reducing the competition for all of the available resources on site. So the moisture, in particular drought stress, the multi-year drought and the increasing temperatures we're seeing for a longer duration each year, the trees have limited access to water availability. And it's the water that allows them to create the sap essentially to push those beetles out. If you've ever seen pitch tubes, they're called, those big globs of sap on a tree, that's the tree trying to push the beetle out. And trees can win that battle if they have enough access to water. But the beetles can win if the trees don't. And so that's the balance. But the idea of inoculating, that's taken some, that's gaining more momentum in some areas. Um, what I found is from a forest perspective and a watershed perspective, it's not really an advised approach yet if you can do thinning because it's so costly. Um, that it's kind of people use it for a specific landscape tree and I think we don't have clear conclusion on whether or not it's effective. So we're using this forest thinning approach because that's really what I've seen it's for a number of reasons, whether it's wildfire risk reduction or just reducing forest stress. It's a more um, kind of appropriate approach for our forested uh, parcels. Thanks, Nasa, and thanks for pointing out those photos because you really see the clear difference, and that's um, it, it's just beautiful when it gets cleared up. And yeah, I think we try to do as much pre-post photos as we possibly yeah. can, and they they really show an interesting difference. I'm going to keep moving, though. Thank you, can Nasa. I ask a quick oh, question, yeah. Nasa. Yeah. Uh, Nasa, hi. This is Laura Peters. Um, I had a quick question about the understory that you spoke of. Would hardwoods be considered understory and that, that they're unbeneficial? I know at the um, grant for tomorrow, we're, we're eradicating all of the hardwood and we're only plant replanting with conifers. And I'm wondering, is that because the hardwood contributes to this understory or why would we not replace it in kind to keep the um, diversity that was there before? Um, so my my first answer would be no, that if these are hardwood, the montane hardwood community that we see through here, especially that oak woodland community, the hardwoods, whether they're black oak or blue oak, the different oak species that we see commonly, they do become the dominant canopy trees as well. But I think what you're asking about, uh, Director Peters, is the, um, the spraying of the stumps. So regeneration from a stump once you've cut a tree is not the same in terms of the adult tree as regeneration from an acorn. So we can talk about the, the grant scope later, but essentially once the tree has been burned by fire, if it regenerates from the stump, you'll have 10 or 20 or 30 little sprouts that are all competing. 
They're all going to be strained for resources. They're going to be thin, weaker trees. They tend to have a dwarfed forest growth form, which tends to be more fire prone. Instead of having adults that sprout up from an acorn, and then you get these taller overstory trees with better spacing. So it's kind of an active management of regeneration post wildfire. So the acorns survive fire and they'll just sprout on their own as, as they grow. Yep. Okay. And the That's conifers are being placed in order to okay, keep the diversity, yeah. to continue the diversity. Right. Otherwise, that makes the sense. acorns will continue right. to outpace. Good. Thank you. Yes, yeah, we got a lot. For homeowners, there's sometimes money from NRCS mm -hmm. type of project, mm -hmm. and we're doing one this year. Yep. We're going to take the understory out. Unfortunately, it's right next to the tar ditch, so it's going to help protect that also. Yeah. Yep. No, and that is a great organization, and we partner with them a lot. But they they are mostly involved in private uh, landowner um, right. projects. Uh, so real quick, uh, hazard tree removal, like I said, we are seeing a lot. Um, the 2022 budget has a pretty hefty level of hazard tree removal uh, in it, and the only reason here is because we are seeing a lot happening all at the campgrounds, at the um, wooey areas that we have, uh, projects and areas that we need to ensure that we're actively managing the watershed and the landscapes that we own. Um, Scott Flat, we conducted 280 at 300 acre fire fuel treatment uh, last year. And the river fire we've talked about, um, there is also, you know, we've, we've done 80 acres of a burn scar, and there is a lot more treatment there to be done over the next number of years as well. Did you get reimbursed for that? That one, uh, no. The, we can talk about that later, but it is a, you know, FEMA, FEMA reimbursement program that um, there is a cost benefit analysis with FEMA that we were just not at the cost. Usually it costs more to adhere to, to administer and move that forward. Than the money they give you. Right. Yeah. It, it just wasn't wasn't worth it for the district to do the administrative activities. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, in 2022, we're going to be working a lot still around uh, Scotts Flat Lake. We've been doing a number of years around Scotts Flat Lake on a timber harvest plan and a fire fuels production plan. Um, we're going to continue working on 300 acres out around Scotts Flat with a 2020 budget of $110,000, which is going to be 100% reimbursable. Um, uh, the Magnolia Road and Parker Ranch Road uh, area, which is Another CAL FIRE CFIT program at about 75% reimbursable. That's about 150 acres of fuel treatment. Um, we're preparing the site now, uh, implement and get in with, uh, with contractors in the spring and the fall of this coming year. That's about a $300,000 budget um, in, the, in the 2022 budget. Again, that's about 75% reimbursable. We have a proposal that we submitted to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy that you will uh, um, consider a application resolution tomorrow. And uh, we're a little behind on that application resolution. We should have done that in January. The tw January 31st was the date of the application. SNC, I think, is, is being lenient with us. And so we appreciate the consideration tomorrow in order to pat that with the application itself. That's uh, grown and blossomed to a little over a million dollar project. Um, at with this, uh, if we get the grant, which we feel like we're pretty healthy on getting the grant, that's about a 90% reimbursable project for 255 acres of river fire um, burn scar treatment, which is a lot better than the FEMA funded application process. Really quick, is that uh, uh, on, the, on the river fire? Is that on NID property? Yes, it is. Particularly, yeah. Of the 2,600 acres that were burned in the river fire, roughly NID owns about 320 of those acres, and we've treated 80 acres this year. Since when was that? October or September? <laughs> 
so we have a lot more to go. Here's a picture of one of the uh, cars that was associated with the river fire along the one of the canals. So you can see some of this cleanup work that we've already done. Cars have been removed, trees have been cut, and the uh, canal has been re, uh, rehabilitated. So uh, some of the additional activities in 22 that uh, the Environmental Resources, Cameron and NASA will be working on are general administrative and planning activities. We have the forest management plan that we anticipate bringing forth to the board for um, to review and take a look at here this year. We're doing a lot of grant writing, management reporting, um, the river fire mitigation and rehabilitation. As we mentioned, that's ongoing. That's going to be a few years worth of activity and program work that um, we're just now getting an understanding of what we had to do in the aftermath of the fire before the rains of the winter. They, what we did withheld and stood pretty well after that bomb cyclone that we had in October and the events in December. Um, so we're happy and thankful for that, and, um, but there's still a lot more work to be done out there. Again, more hazard trees, fire fuel remediation. Um, Nason and Cameron do a lot of also watershed education, regional partnerships. We have a Civic Spark uh, program, that's an AmeriCorps uh, program that we'll be re-bringing back. We haven't had them for a couple years. Um, two, two partners that will come in and work with us hand in hand, they come in around August. And uh, it's a great, a great opportunity. As a matter of fact, that's how we received Cameron Townsend as, as a staff member after that. So it, it's a really great way for young folks um, after college to come in and really start working on projects and program that is really near and dear to their heart. And uh, environmental resources seems to be a really good opportunity for that. They're focused on a lot of watershed-based um, activities out of this Civic Spark program. There's a number of them, but. There's a green zone off to the left of the canal. Sure looks like it. Yeah. I wonder what that is. Yeah. Some agricultural endeavor. This Something. is to Something's over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, NASA is our partner um, in crime with uh, CABI, the Regional Water Management Group. We talked about that a number of months ago. Um, we're working with a mastered stewardship agreement with the Forest Service. That is an understanding to work on Forest Service lands, knowing that watersheds and, um, and ecosystems have no administrative boundary. So if we're working on a property on NID land and we've got Forest Service right next to us, uh, this Master Stewardship Agreement helps us just expand our project worked into there and any of the revenue that we receive from removal of trees or anything, we can utilize that money to put it right back into the process, into the project. Um, so let's see, finally, there we go. So we're going to switch gears here uh, a bit. Thank you for, for that. What's my, how my time? Okay. So information technology. Um, we've got a three-person staff and uh, three great full-time staff for people. John Ortiz, he's our information technology administrator. Uh, Rod McGee and Chris Butcher are our technology analysts. They've been around for many years and uh, are very thankful to have them in our midst as COVID just descended upon us. Um, if it weren't for, you know, the three of them and their expertise and their help, we would be uh, struggling even more than, you know, sometimes it feels like we struggle. But I'll tell you, the, the work that they put in and, and the time that they put in for NID overall in our IT systems, um, we, we are like many agencies and organizations that over the years, uh, information technology just really hasn't had the investment that it's needed to keep up with the demand and keep up with the times and to keep up with the amount of data that just goes across the waves every day. Um, we experience it here when we have uh, difficulties with our, our Zoom calls, um, but you know, if it weren't for some of the um, applications that they've installed, some of the hardware that we've done in the last 24 months um, in particular, uh, we'd be quite uh, in, in a worse position than we are. So I really thank them for the work that they're doing. Uh, since then, we've had a number of, uh, of temporary staff over the years. Uh, we've got three really good ones right now, Joe, Brent, and Chris, that are helping out as well. Uh, we are just in a location that is difficult to find and retain quality um, workers that have a skill set that can utilize 
the old legacy systems that we have mm -hmm. while transitioning that future into the next level of information technology that we're going to need in the next 24 months. And so uh, we're thankful for the staff and the work that they're doing right yeah. now. So is the budget model reflect six staff? So if you could, you would fill those temp positions those with temp career? Positions. They are in the budget. There's, there's three, as consultant services, so there's three full-time staff in IT um, currently filled, and then there's one additional, so there's four budgeted for 2022, and it has not been filled yet. So we, those three temporary positions are, one is through uh, temp staffing, and then the other two are consultants. But this is definitely one of our higher risk areas in the district right now. This and finance are definitely by far my biggest concerns for the district. Um, we have been laying out some work plans for the next you know, six months, a year, 18 months, and then looking out because we do need to make several upgrades to maintain and compliance with different types of security things that we're required to do, but also to continue to ensure we can function on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you have any white hats come in and probe our system? Yeah, well, we had a black hat come sure. in and break our system. Um, the, after the hacking incident occurred, we did hire a third party who came in, and we, you know, we actually had to open up a file with the FBI and have them also do an investigation. We've received a final report um, related to exactly what happened with the hacking. We're unable to make that report in any way, shape, or form public just because of the security issues. Yeah. associated with the data that's in the report. Um, but the we have some vulnerabilities. There have been several upgrades to firewalls and outdated servers and some some of those types of things that have occurred just, you know, since the hacking. We still have a long way to go to make sure that um, we're well secured, but also that we're running efficiently. And we have, unfortunately, several old servers that are from the 2010 era which in IT is like a dinosaur now. Um, so we are kind of going through and systematically upgrading things. Um, IT um, division head right now, John Ortiz, he's developing a longer term plan that we can talk about more in depth with the board once we finish getting it flushed out. But I would definitely um, expect to see the request for some very significant investment in IT over the next five to. years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank yep. you. So the support, um, this group supports all infrastructure, hardware support. Um, you can see the bullet list here. I don't need to run through it. Um, the application support um, from our SCADA to Lucidity to LaserFish, uh, GIS technology. Uh, they combine our cybersecurity completely. Um, remote site support for recreation and hydro departments as well, so coordination and cooperation with those departments. And then different ancillary systems and softwares, cameras, um, our fueling system, our corporate fueling system. Um, so a lot of different hats that these, that our IT uh, department wears uh, for a very small department, considering other uh, sister organizations of our size. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done in this support mechanism here. And, and um, Just to give you a sense, I think um, we had a meeting recently with PCWA staff, just a staff-to-staff -staff meeting, and they, they brought their IT org chart. Um, so we have three, right? We have our fourth one that's not funded. And what did they have? 17. 17 people. Oh, my <laughs> Yeah. I'm not saying that's the right number. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not necessarily you know the right number, but it just metric, but yeah, but I think one of the um, considerations that we all need to think about is that things are just becoming more and more technology based. You know, before many of the reporting and the monitoring of all of our systems was done manually, and now that's just simply not the case. Um, we are expected to report real-time data, whether it be, you know, related to our hydropower facilities or through our treatment plants. And we're, you know, we have alarm systems, and it's a lot of integrated information that's coming in and out of this building as well as hydro. And it, the the level of technology is in no way, shape, or form going to go down. Yeah. yeah. So I think over the next 10 years, it'll be an exciting time in IT, but I think we need to focus on it. So, um, you know, as yeah, as a general manager, those are definitely my top two concerns by far are finance and 
IT. We yeah. may need to do it faster. And we are. We are. You, you know, you can only bite off as much as you can do at one time. Um, and we are somewhat limited with staff, so we're kind of systematically prioritizing based off of uh, first from a risk basis and then moving forward. Got to do it right. Yeah. Uh, so in 2021. Um, Again, kind of just for the sake of time, I'm going to speed through a few of these um, slides. Technology infrastructure enhancements, um, a lot of the journey and, and migratory to the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, we were based not in the cloud in a lot of our applications. And so that's, that's a really m good move to Office 365. Uh, the security breach was a, was a massive lift. Um, uh, security framework and then uh, their help desk, you know, that's, that's internal help desk. That's 1,200, 1200 tickets that came into them for any number of things, whether it was I can't turn on my computer this morning or, uh, you know, whatever, the screen's blank and it's not, not nothing's happening. So that that's a pretty pretty big number for, for a small team to handle all these other application and, and security act activities. So in the future, moving into 2022, uh, big move is Pentamation upgrade. Um, that's our software program. Hasn't been upgraded for a number of years. Yeah, let's just touch on that for a second. So about the board will recall previously the district was moving forward with an ERP, which is basically the financial system, which is Tyler. One of the things we've done until the finances are cleaned up and more efficient and we're going through proper closing and reconciliation procedures, it would be really difficult to move what we currently have on to Tyler, almost impossible to make it, make it succeed. So one of the issues with Pentamation right now is that um, any one of those financial softwares, as with most softwares, you are required to purchase an annual upgrade and that annual upgrade provides usability of the system. It allows for them to provide you support. It's basically like upgrading your operating system for your phone. If you didn't do it for 10 years, we've lost a lot of the functionality of the system as well as the ability to get support. So we are going to, as an interim step, purchase the upgrades to Pantomation. So we, there is a cost to it. We did budget for it this year. It's about between eight and $10,000 a year that we didn't pay to get us up to the current version, which is a cloud-based, and then we can clean up all the data and processes and then move it over to Tyler. If you jump from basically messy data into Tyler, you know, garbage it's garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And it'll just make it more difficult to clean up the finances. Yes. Um, so that is definitely, the current Pentamation software is on a very, very old server. So if the, you know, electricity goes out or something happens to that server, you know, we're fanning it with, you know, feathers and lighting sage and doing anything we can to make sure that thing comes back up. Yeah, it does house all of our data. So it is in a very uh, concerning spot. So that is definitely our highest priority right now is move, getting that off of that server and up back into the new version in the cloud. Yeah. What, what's the timeline that you envision? So I think we all have different opinions. <laughs> I'm not very patient yes, when it comes to this. Um, if she thinks it's going to take it take five months, and I, I don't think we're going to take five months. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. so I go two months. Okay. Yeah. So we're working on it. We're, we're working diligently on it. I don't know if we'll I can get it done as soon as we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, you can get a hundred bucks from each of us. <laughs> all right, we're going to keep moving, so this is all in okay, let's, yeah, more, more questions, but I uh, appreciate it. It's a good conversation. Uh, security frameworks, application support, um, control systems. So just a myriad of different things that the IT department definitely works on on a daily and monthly basis. Um, mm -hmm. So that's of the IT. Next, we'll pop over to communications. Uh, Susan Lauer is our communication specialist. I mean, Susan's been with us for a number of years. Really, our primary goal of our communications team, uh, well, person, <laughs> individual, <laughs> to produce information uh, and increase the community awareness about NID, mm -hmm. um, to enhance our overall image with the district, and to be as transparent as we possibly can to the community. And so, how we do that as much as we can is through timely inform and informative press releases. Um, monthly newsletters with our internal and external social media, um, monthly blogs, website updates, new website, um, 
videos, bill inserts, advertising on local media, et cetera. So there's a number of different channels. We'll look at them here in a minute. Our, our overarching branding you know, is to really help the community, help NID become a more valued, trusted source for their customers. Um, and so that our customers are satisfied. That truly is what our operations, our maintenance, our hydro, our rec staff in the field are doing. What we want to make sure that we're trying to do from sort of an administrative perspective is trying to get that information to people to show what it is we're doing for the community and for our customer base in the world. Only, you know, only a small amount of people see our staff in the field doing something in a, in a hole, in a pipe, in a, you know, um, but uh, it really is, we're trying to get this to the rest of the broader community that don't see us every day. Um, so here are some of the communication channels that we operate in, uh, clearly our website, different newsletters, um, uh, news releases, e-blast, social media, uh, bill inserts when we when we need to, videos, display ads at certain levels. So these are all sort of utilized at different parts of the of our of our process. And depending on the project, the program, um, we utilize what we believe and hopefully will be the best messaging platform to our community. Uh, here's a quick overview of 2021. Um, this bar graph really shows kind of where our visiting web page, where people want to go. Uh, over nearly 12,000 page views over the year on uh, just the jobs page alone. And so uh, that is, I think that is, uh, you know, that's not a, um, so, you know, this is just the top five, five web pages that people have gone to with an average stay of, you know, one and a half minutes per time that they're on our website searching around for different clicks. And uh, and they'll go from, you know, one page to the other. It's usually about 2.2 .2 pages per time that a unique uh, user comes onto our website. Um, 240,000 page views last year. Uh, just, you know, in 2020, we had uh, slightly higher than that. We had about 296,000 page views on the NID website overall. Not sure what the reason for that is, but uh, there it is. Um, we have different engage lists, and I know we've talked about this uh, specifically for the plan for water concept, but as you go in on the webpage, there's a join our newsletter. There's a whole list. There's like way too many, and I understand there's way too many projects or programs in there that somebody could click. Plan for water's in there, and so you can click on it, but there's also about 15 or 17 others. And so um, Plan for Water currently has about 525 followers. Uh, overall, we have about 4,600 subscribers to the NID website, so anytime we send out a web blast or a, um, a news information on our web uh, to, to the folks on, that are subscribed to the website, that's 4,600 4, direct emails to somebody's mailbox. Um, interestingly there, we are finding in just, let's see, January's numbers alone, um, we had a 70% open rate for the pipeline and the newsletter and a 50% open rate for the GM newsletter. Awesome. Which is huge, which is massive. Like that mm -hmm. usually, you know, when you send an email out, you're at maybe 20% is a big deal. So uh, a lot of people are interested in those newsletters and mm -hmm. it's, it, people are opening them, which is really nice to see. Hey, I, I think that's Yeah. Well, question is sure. So, when you show the 6,000 people who have opened the web pages about board meetings, is there a way to drill into, say, what division? Because I, my colleague here, Mr. Beer, Princess Beerwagon, says I never hear from anybody, and so I'd be interesting to know. She gets calls from my constituents, and I get calls from his constituents. So it'd be really <laughs> kind of interesting to know if we have the capability. To see what the analytics. For it. I just was wondering if we have the capability to say of those 6,000 people, there were. No I, I, I don't think because they're IP addresses. Yeah which oh, aren't sure. necessarily coordinated okay. with where you are, right? It's just a, yeah. IP, a, a ping from a computer. Okay. We, we, yeah, we, we've, thought, we've, we've thought about trying to find a way, and we've put 
tickets into our um, website developer who who organizes our drop down menu when you put your I want information on plan for water. Mm -hmm. Right now all they put is their email address. Mm -hmm. We have requested to see if we can also add a couple other um, a couple other boxes where it'd be like, you know, what's your zip code? What's your address? Or a link to one of our emails. Right. Who, who's your director or where do you live? You know, click here. So we, we can we're trying to get a little more granular in some of that. Um, but that one, I doubt it. Okay. But well, we, but it is interesting to get a little more granular yeah. in some way. Sure. And may, that may not be the view. Sure. And then I have a, a just a, a comment, <clears throat> and that is, um, I'm always the one that is harping or maybe asking for when press releases go out that we as board members get them simultaneously as uh -huh. when they go out, so that when I go to the grocery store, I don't find somebody that said. Yeah. We we can. You should have that. That, that I know, I know, but it, it's kind of hit and miss. Is my my. I think the concern came up when we had an unplanned outage, and that that was one because it was staff who normally wouldn't that do it. One, yeah, but they did it on the weekend. When but we have just, we can do that. Here, there have been many, many, and so we've. And I, Lauren's asked. We've all kind of individually said, "Gosh, it'd be really great to get those either in advance or at least simultaneously." I'll, I'll go back and look, but I do know that there, when we do send a news release, there's basically a click, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's a list of emails that is on a, a listserv, and the district director emails are on that list. So it okay. should be occurring. Simultaneously, that it goes to the UBINET or the union right. or the Gold Country Media, which are classic for getting uh, not shunted from your main email spam into or something. yes, it could be going to but spam. We can, well, we can let us confirm. Keep, we'll keep double checking. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. I can't tell you how many times I've been in one of the grocery stores yeah. and UBINET has something in there and says, "Well, I understand blah blah blah," and I'm like, "What? <laughs> well, it was in your press release." Oh, <laughs> and then just as a side note, Director Peters had asked that we add the snow data to the website, so we did that. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. 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 And you can put Rick's email down for my contact. Yeah, she doesn't know why she's getting all the calls. Why do I get all these now? Okay, uh, In the background where you can't see it, they all go to me. This is just a page on some of the drought. Uh, and conservation uh, campaigns that we had uh, we had done um, about that. This is um, oh yeah. We're kind of isolated up not isolated up here. There's a bigger picture in the state of California. Can mm -hmm. we start including more of the state of California drought situation? Because up here we're in heaven. So let me I, I think that's a really good I point. I think that is a good idea. Yeah. Just so I understand, so information related to drought in the state is right. just our yeah. area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in comparison. I, I can I yeah. can I can fill you in on two more slides and then I'll i I'll touch that. Um, this KPI slide here is mostly about about the plan for water component, not necessarily about mm -hmm. NID specific, but um, this is uh, we, we have a um, a consultant who's helping us with outreach and social media engagement nice. um, through the plan for water process. These are some of the key performance indicators that we have for them currently. They've been engaged since uh, late December, and so we're working on doing roughly 50 posts per month um, through these Facebook or through these social media channels, uh, a number of blogs, a minimum of three to um, three per month blogs, uh, direct emails as well, uh, all, all regarding the plan for water. Um, Director Johansson, this engagement calendar, so here's a, here's a snapshot of last month's social media postings that we had done on a number of different social media sites. This is a good opportunity, and I can transfer that. Can you see that? Really? Um, it, it's on the website. It's better on your screen. It's on the plan for water website, and it's updated right now with, Feb with February's um, uh, blog schedule and, and uh, social media post schedule through the end of the month. Here's where we can incorporate other social media posts that are through RWA or Aqua or NACWA or other state agencies, DWR, that are trusted sources that we can take their postings, retweet, repost, reboost. So those are very easy to do and that helps with their traffic and our traffic as well. 
You guys know Robert Shibatani? You probably the Shibatani group? No, okay. yeah. The Shibatani group. He does a, a, a really excellent state of California drought map that he publishes through that Maven picks up mm -hmm. um, yeah. every whatever couple of weeks. And it's really good. If I, and I try to post that myself on my own Facebook. Yeah, um, our our um, our agency that we're working with, they're they're really good at finding third party um, groups. Okay. We're we're working with them on trying to, you know, um, kind of hone it down. Sometimes some of the posts are are you know they've been wanting to do like general West Coast Colorado to mm -hmm. yeah. Oregon based, and it was like no, that's just not what we want. But if there's something that has come out from DWR, the Water Board. Mm -hmm. Aqua, Naqua, you know, any of those other trusted organizations that really help tell the larger story of California, the Farm Bureau, right? We want to grab those and help promote those to our local agencies or local um, community. Yeah, I think I think we've made huge strides yeah. in communication. Yeah, we put time and, into this. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And, and these uh, posts that you show as examples are excellent and very visually appealing. So yeah. I, I, I appreciate the this effort. that we've hired is, is really And good. also other irrigation districts put out notices. Yep. I, read yeah. one, I read one Absolutely. today from an irrigation district as well. We got 3,600 acre feet this year for 30,000 acres of fully developed ag land orchards. And uh, we have contracts, but if there's no water, we don't get the water anyway if we have the contract. So this, they had joined trying to find get water transfers in. It's that dire, and the price is just going up, and they don't think they're going to get water. Well, so, so, some of these posts, you got to be careful about context, and you got to, you know, it has to well, fit within an overall. The con yeah, but the contrast between 180 8,000 acre feet versus 3,600 is strong. Yeah. Um, I think having our community aware aware of the broader context is very helpful because I think we are going to be called upon to be part of the the solution, the solution and yeah. we're not going to be able to just sit in our cocoon right. and yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I think that is really important. So this is a the social engagement piece of it is um, is going to keep growing, and we're anticipating to keep doing more of it. Good job. Um, quickly, uh, last uh, but certainly not least, our uh, safety department is uh, Don Bird, uh, our safety analyst, and Cindy Ware, our safety technician, um, and they are doing uh, uh, again just a a great job of ensuring that our staff. You know, from OSHA-related activities to to electrical components to ergonomics to COVID um, protocols are really helping with rounding out the safety department and uh, and our efforts throughout the area and at the district. Um, we've got uh, kind of generally overview of our injury and illness prevention program. That's a kind of a very meaty document that needs updated. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're moving forward with updating each of those sections. There's about 15 different sections of that um, on how we, as a district, manage and actively engage in some of these safety um, safety programs throughout the district, from heat injury illness to fall protection to electrical safety, like I mentioned. Uh, That's a full-time job. It, it sure is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot. And there's going to be some very significant fines associated with OSHA violations, and most of the ones I have seen have been related to poor tracking of training or procedures. Um, so when I first came here, I was blown away about how robust our safety program was, but how good the tracking is. Um, yeah, we wouldn't want OSHA to go to Lincoln. You could have a good <laughs> Right. So we do. We Don and Cindy are just. Yeah. hammering daily, weekly, monthly on our training programs from new hires to CPR. Uh, we've got a, a robust uh, system that we use um, that helps track and train each individual staff member in each individual classification on the, the timing of their next updated training, whether it's a three-year instance or an annual instance. Um, and so we're really, they're just constantly moving forward on a lot of that. Here's just a few 
slides on some of the training and some of the activities. This wasn't a training at all. This was confined space entry um, on Banner Lava Cap Road. Not sure exactly, uh, might have been last year. Um, but some of the issues that uh, our staff has to go out and make sure that our safety staff shows up, make sure that uh, the staff that are, are doing the work, whether it's in ops or maintenance or the hydro uh, division or rec are really making sure that we're, we're doing what we need to do on a daily, on, on these basis. This is a fall protection along Bowman Dam, an inspection. So I had to set up the davit arm, uh, make sure that it's all protected and the staff are, are secure and safe. Um, here's a confined space rescue training that we did um, out at uh, Lake of the Pines water treatment plant. Then uh, we have a couple years ago, a few years ago now, we invested in a hazardous, environmental hazardous response unit. It's this little trailer that uh, um, we have shown up at probably three or four different hazardous waste spills in Nevada County uh, in the last few years and are the only organization with the equipment to actually take care of it, whether it's a, a, a diesel rig spill off of Highway 20. Um, this particular picture was a, uh, uh, this is at, where's the lock at Longer Beam? Longer Beam, yeah. Uh, that's our, our um, gas dock that just went over. Yikes. Yeah, in the, wall, in the, in the rainstorm. So, so we built it for somewhere, somewhere else, right? Uh, sure, and how long? Typically, it's pretty hard. You pay more to issue the bill. Yeah. Collecting the money. We, we track it, and if it's extreme, oh, yeah. uh, we may. Do you have any metrics on? Yeah. yeah. Like how many snake how many, bites, how many insect bites? Well, I was thinking more of maybe accidents or whatever. I mean, snake bites are really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have workers' comp, uh, yeah, loss I runs, et cetera. It would be interesting. Oh, it's just no. We well, can bring those back. So we have that data. Yeah, we have okay. that data. I think we have the data, but it would be interesting to know. You know, you have metrics in some of these other Yeah, we have. Things. Absolutely. Well, yeah. like we could also how many, do a workers' yeah, comp three review three one time three. with the board. If you've got, have you ever had one of those? No. We can do that. We'll do it in closed session. Usually there's the legal ramifications. Uh -huh. But, um, yeah. yeah, we can do that. Yeah. We, the, any agency always has workers' comp cases going. So I it's a work. normal. I just wonder, but, you know, there's some places that have, you go, okay, you know, 200 days without an accident, you know, and they post, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's and kind I of was on a road there a couple of days ago said there have been 11 accidents in the last six months. Oh, I was just on that road, too. <laughs> Napa? What yeah, the what, one, one, Lakeville two, Highway. Lakeville. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're approaching our four o'clock, and we just have <laughs> one. We just have. Uh, I, I'm I'm bringing back a little uh, communications video that we had uh, put together a couple uh, years ago, just to set us off. Yeah, we'll feel like we're um, in a banjo down by the river. Yeah. Um, it's a local. It's a lo She's a local uh, artist that we had um, um, used her song. Um, Anyway, so look ahead to safety, just a number of trainings, uh, annual continuous trainings. Um, then we have a series of biannual trainings, and these are all contained in the budget. We have to plan for them for the year in advance, um, bring folks in to, to do some of these trainings. So uh, we'll finish it with this, and uh, thank you. But uh, kind of a chump choppy, but uh, yeah, she's a local uh, artist and 
that version of her song for this particular nice. video. So Very we nice. thank Maury Seidel. Very nice. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Very well done. I have four o'clock. Yes. <laughs> okay. Moving right along, we'll switch over to Plant for Water. And who's going to kick that off today? Plant for Water Workshop, for water workshop number four, Water Rights Stage Two. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm Chip Close, Water Operations Manager. Today we're going to do a high-level overview of water rights and hopefully touch on the legalities and all the rules and regulations of water rights in the first section of the discussion tonight. Second session, we'll dive into NID's water rights specifically and give you a high level overview of those as well. Um, tonight's presentation is split between Dustin Cooper, our management, and Tor Larson. He is our water resources superintendent and all things water rights. So, uh, with that, uh, I will pass the microphone, so to speak, to Dustin. We were, I think we had another item on the agenda first. Do you have the, no, you I didn't, but. Um, just really quick, I wanted to just do a quick process check-in with everybody. So one of the items that we discussed at a previous meeting, and it actually came from our recommendation from one of the community members participating, was to do a focused conversation related to risk. And I think that that is a very good idea and is warranted to do prior to strategic planning. So what I'm proposing to the board is to add in, not a full stage, but a whole meeting dedicated to risk where we can review the high risk things, whether it be um, from specific infrastructure failing, um, lack of replacement of main line that's all aging, the flume associated with South Yuba Canal, um, some of those costs, what would happen to our service, how it would be impacted. And there are a lot of different studies that have been done for a variety of reasons, um, whether it be related to FERC and NERC requirements and hydropower, or as the board just knows, um, the counties each have a hazard mitigation plan, and kind of pulling that all together in one conversation so we can have a conversation about it prior to going into the strategic planning session. So I wanted to understand if there was consensus on the board, if that was an um, acceptable idea, so we would add that in right after the watershed, so it would be kind of a new stage four before we tear into strategic planning. April? I think that's an excellent idea. So it's not in the current um, matrix. I wanted to. You said, you said uh, something before strategic plan. There's another one. Strategic yeah, Chris, you want to pop that up? Watershed. So watershed. So we are in water rights now. This should take just one meeting, unless there's a lot of questions and everyone desires to have a second meeting, which is totally fine. Um, then we added in watershed, which should be, I think we have it scheduled for one meeting. March. March. And then. Um, we we'll, would we'll be looking to get into risk in April and then tier into strategic planning, which will take several meetings. Does that sound reasonable? Risk is great. I think it will really help inform our strengths and weaknesses conversation because yes. there's some yeah. critical things that need to be addressed. I do too, especially from the perspective that um, you know high risk items have a potential to not only impact you from a fiscal perspective, but also from the ability to provide services. All. Right. And so I think um, it's worth a conversation when strategic planning, which when they'll ultimately tear into master planning and then capital improvement plans. I think it's a really good idea. We are. At, I was listening to NPR. We're at the five year anniversary of the Orville Hillway. Right. And you know, it's on everybody's mind. Okay. Just know that where we are, safety-wise, is very important. Great, an excellent idea. And that was a risk that could have been avoided. Yes, it could have, according to the experts. Well, I'm not one, but 
So Jennifer, once we approve this um, condition, can we get a new printout? Of Absolutely. It'd be great. We yeah. sure can. And, and just to, for my clarification, that this risk would be before the, the strength sweetens the dog. I thought it would be a conversation that would help inform mm -hmm. the understanding of the strengths and weaknesses um, and threats, but also the magnitude of them. Mm -hmm. Strategic planning has to take that into account. I, I would highly recommend it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it sounds good. I also would like an update on the consultant hiring process. Meeting when you that. Oh, okay. the uh, plan for water hydrology. Oh, yeah. So we have um, we submitted the RFP as the board knows. It mm -hmm. closes this Thursday. I think that we are not going to get a great response. So we haven't had um, we've had a lot of communication with consultants, but we haven't had a whole lot of interest. In fact, we've had some of the bigger firms indicate that they do not have the bandwidth to handle that type of project with the scope of the project and the political nature of the project. One of the things that we're up against right now is obviously there's a huge labor shortage going on in every industry across the board, but there is also some very significant labor constraints in more of the technical labor mm. categories, such as engineering, modeling, and due to the high visibility of this particular effort and the complexity associated with kind of it's an all-in-one package we're asking for, we're not getting, the, it doesn't appear we're going to have the greatest response. So I've had several firms notify us um, and say that they're not going to be bidding on it. Um, we've received very, very, I really received question, written questions from one firm. And I did a lot of personal outreach um, to a variety of firms, and they were very thoughtful in looking at it. However, they've kind of come back and said that they're, they're having some issues. So I think, um, you know, Thursday we'll know for sure. And then um, based off of what the, the pool looks like, because this is not a project, if it, large modeling efforts take a lot of horsepower. This is not a one or two person firm project. I mean, you just simply wouldn't have that. You wouldn't even have the IT infrastructure to deal with running those types of models. Um, so we will probably be kind of reassessing, coming back with a game plan. I've been doing some more conversations with consultants, um, talking through some ideas on how to possibly split the project out to make it more palatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm devising a plan now, uh, but I do want to give the opportunity for the RFP proposal period to close. So that is Thursday. So we'll keep you posted on how that is looking. And then if um, there is, bless you. Thank you. We're having, I'm personally having technical difficulties <laughs> today. My third device here. Has there been any conversation with the previous consultant that's very familiar with our system and that? With HDR? Yeah, yes, it was pretty clear from this board that yes, the board was not interested in hiring HDR. We were looking for someone other than them. No. Yeah. They're a very qualified firm. Uh, I don't, you know, um, I don't disagree. HDR is a countrywide firm. Um, you know, I can't say that, I, I'd have to reach out to them. I, I'm not sure what taste was left to their mouth over the whole process. But the, the RFP is open to them if they want to. We did have a hard, so putting together a proposal of that magnitude is an expensive endeavor. Um, they were aware of the board sentiments regarding their continued service in that capacity, so it's highly unlikely that they would propose on that particular project. So do we need to schedule a little conversation that maybe that's not the board's I think that um, we should see what happens on Thursday, and and I have a couple of things in the works that I think um, you know have the potential to leverage the work that HCR previously completed, as well as pull in some other firms. Um, you know, there's a lot of really great firms out there, so I think we can put together still a really good team, and at the end, you know, we might even get even a better product 
um, by having more eyes on it rather than just one firm. So it was a key, yeah, we have, we have options and we have solicited assistance from um, our um, partners in the environmental arena. They've helped review the RFP and provide us some comments, which we appreciate and we did include. And if you're wanting to view those, they are available on our website as well as, as we've reached out to some other folks to participate in any consultant selection. So at this point, we're in a little wait and see to see what proposals we get. If the pool's not looking great, then we'll re kind of reassess and, and move forward. So is there any more questions regarding the check-in and the process? All right, is there any questions from the public before we get started? So just as a reminder with the public, um, you can ask a question by raising your hand, or you can utilize the chat function. And just a reminder, the chat function is not intended to be a chatting between members of the public. It is really only intended to be a question and answer. So, and that helps us be able to see the questions that are current and being asked so we can make sure that they're asked and answered. Otherwise, when there's a lot of chatting going back, on back and forth, um, you know, we will end up losing um, questions up in the thread. So with that, is there any questions from members of the public before we move on? I'm not seeing any. All right, we're looking good. And so now we're going to turn it over. Um, staff is going to partner up on this particular endeavor regarding water rights. So this is intended to be a high level, high level overview of the district's current water rights. Um, and Tor, thank you so much. He is our resident expert on all things water rights, and he actually manages um, all the reporting, all the regulatory aspects of our water rights. Um, and then as well as Chip, as everybody knows, he is the operations manager. And then we also have Dustin Cooper, who is on joining us via Zoom, and he will also partake in this particular um, conversation. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes, sir. Good. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Chris? Sure. <laughs> Try that again. I've got Chip in control over here. There you go. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Jennifer and Chip. Um, so uh, I'll be handling part one and two of our discussion this afternoon. Um, and then Tor and Chip will take over uh, part three in IDs water rights. So um, part one, surface water rights. And I emphasize here, this is, this is course 101. Um, I expect to hear some very tough questions and I may punt on those if, if I consider them graduate level courses. But um, this, is, this is an introduction. It's designed to be an introduction. Um, as you'll see here shortly, it, it, there's a lot of nuance and complexity once you get into, once you get into the details of water law. Um, so hopefully I'm providing a, a good overview and a foundation from which we could have a, a, a good discussion moving forward. And um, please, I, I do want to emphasize something that, that Jennifer mentioned, that this is meant to be interactive. So if uh, board members or public, if you have any questions, please stop me. And um, Chris, I don't, I don't know that I will be able to see the written questions. Will, will somebody be tasked with stopping and, and they can um, voice those so that I can provide an answer, or try to provide an answer? I, sh I will do it, Dustin. We'll, we will make sure that you're aware so we can get them in as you're going. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we'll start with uh, what would seem like an easy question, but it, again, it can be quite complex and technical in nature, but what is surface water? Um, the laws in California that govern surface water are different than the laws governing groundwater, as an example. So occasionally you get into um, a, a question about which set of laws are we operating under? Are we operating under surface water laws or groundwater laws? Um, so what is surface water? It's, it's obviously the water that's flowing in a natural channel, uh, but then it is also uh, underflow in that natural channel. And then also the law considers subterranean streams to be uh, basically 
uh, treated as surface water. Now, what is a subterranean stream? It's, it's a technical question. It's water flowing underground in a known and definite channel. Um, that's to be contrasted with what's called percolating groundwater, which is everything else. So you've got um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. That's a, a law passed in 2014 that uh, regulates percolating groundwater. So uh, today we'll, we will not be discussing SIGMA or any of the laws governing groundwater. We're gonna focus on surface water. Um, and then again, one of those quirks, there's a lot of quirky things in water law, at least they're, they're quirky to me, but if you have a spring that flows off of your property, that's considered surface water and it's governed by the surface water laws. But if that spring does not flow off your property, it's, it's not regulated as surface water, even, even if it would otherwise appear to a normal person to be surface water. Uh, next slide, please. Justin, can you just, uh, just tell me what is underflow of surface streams? Is that just when the stream is percolating into the underground? Yeah, so um, this pops up in a couple different situations. One, you have... Uh, I believe this to be true of some of NID's uh, streams in your service area. Um, you'll have water that's flowing on the surface and then it'll go underground for a, you know, a period um, or a distance and then it'll pop back up. So even if okay. that water is underground for a segment of stream, it's, it's considered underflow and regulated as surface water. Um, another situation where this pops up is, is because water tends to be plentiful in the vicinity of a surface water source, folks will drill wells really close, you know, on the bed bank or channel even of a stream. And uh, a lot of times that, while they're otherwise pumping from a groundwater well, it's considered a diversion of a surface water um, source and treated as surface water. Justin, we do have a question um, that just popped up on the chat from Mr. Feldman. It's along the same lines. Um, I think you can answer fairly easily. How is fractured rock in the Sierra considered? Underflow or subterranean? Yeah, in most cases, it would be considered percolating groundwater. Um, that is not regulated as a surface water right. Uh, also not regulated by Sigma because Sigma only applies to the uh, alluvial groundwater basins in the state, at least currently. But that would be governed by uh, groundwater law, which is a, um, a, a, a series of cases that have arisen over, over California's history. So would it be safe to say, Dustin, that in order for surface water rights to apply to underflow, it would have direct connectivity to the surface water itself? Yeah, I think in general, yes, that, that would be accurate. Okay, so types of surface water rights. Uh, this is a, not a complete listing, but it covers the substantial majority of uh, surface water rights in California. I, I've listed them in their general order of priority. So first you have a, a thing called Pueblo rights. Um, this, uh, you know, there's, the, what I love about water law is that there's a, a combination of a, of a historical component. There's, uh, you know, a scientific component to water law. There's water quality. It gets highly technical. Um, and this is one of those areas where there, it brings in the historical component. So the Pueblo rights in California, there's only a couple of them to my knowledge. Uh, their uh, LA has one and San Diego has the other, uh, but they originate um, out of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago, um, which ended the Mexican-American War. And as part of the negotiation that ended that war, uh, the uh, Mexican government wanted to make sure that their um, pueblos, their, their uh, the cities at the time, um, had sufficient water for their continued growth. So uh, there's a thing called Pueblo rights. We don't have them, at least they've never been recognized in Northern California. Um, 
next you have riparian rights. Uh, riparian rights have a priority date of statehood. So uh, they're, uh, if you consider the vintage of their right, think of statehood, which is 1850. And then you, you have a, a federal reserved right to water in, in many cases. So this could be, um, this could originate from a, a tribal uh, dedication. Uh, so where the federal government has dedicated land to a tribal entity. Um, some, occasionally you'll see it with military bases or national forests or national parks, uh, but those are all federal reserved rights. And then the priority of that right would depend on the date of the reservation. Uh, and then next you have pre-1914 water rights. That uh, uh, is a whole class of appropriative water rights that are, are dated before December 19th, 1914. And then you have post-1914 appropriative rights. So in uh, California has somewhat of a unique uh, water right system. We'll, we'll dive into a little more detail here in a, in a moment, but uh, it's called so, the- so, Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Director Heck had a quick question for you. Hi, Dustin. Could you give us an example of the riparian rights? Are, are those also, if someone has a riparian right, do they have a right to defer? Yes, we will actually get into this um, in, the, in the next couple of slides, but the answer is yes, they have a right to divert. And they also have a right to... I'm sorry, would you re repeat that, Director Heck? Oh, I just said it would be great if, as you went through these, you gave an example, like you gave the Pueblo rights in LA and San Diego. Repairing rights, like what would be an example of a repairing right where someone had the right to divert from the repairing area? That would just be interesting. Yeah, do we have any in our county? And do we have any, in, yeah, and do we have any in our, in our service area? In our yes. Uh, we will okay. actually go through that. We're going to go through the riparian rights and appropriative rights in greater detail in the, in the following slides. Um, so th those two water rights make up the, the substantial majority of water rights in California, that is riparian and appropriative rights. And because of that, it, it's, it's a unique water right system that California has. It's called the dual system of water rights. Many other states uh, have either an appropriative right doctrine or a riparian right doctrine, but not both. So hence, California has the dual system of water rights. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Okay, so here we go, Director Heck. Um, a riparian right, the basic principle is that all owners of property adjacent to a stream have the right to reasonable use of water from the stream. Uh, there's also a a form of riparian right that attaches to a natural lake if you own property adjacent, immediately adjacent to a natural lake. So any natural water course, um, you can potentially have a water right, uh, a riparian water right. This uh, derives from English common law. It's a, a predominant system in the Eastern United States, basically where there's a wetter climate riparian rights uh, seem to exist. Um, and uh, Director Heck, to your uh, question, riparian water can be used on any reasonable beneficial use on the riparian property. So it can be diverted and it can be used on the riparian property. Next slide. So there's some limits on a riparian water right. Um, so I'm gonna have a little test here on the next slide. So I want you to listen very carefully and then we'll test you. Um, the riparian right can only be used on riparian land that is within the same watershed. So you cannot transfer the uh, riparian water right to another property and you cannot appropriate a riparian water right. Um, next uh, limit is that the right can only be used or it only extends to natural stream flow. So you cannot divert imported water or previously stored water. This bullet point actually is a fairly significant issue in the state of California um, because we have two very large projects, the State Water Project and Central Valley Project. 
that store millions of acre feet in Northern California. And then in the summer months, they release that stored water into the Delta for uh, maintenance of water quality, uh, fishery purposes. And then obviously they, they pump some of that water for Southern California use. And that there's an argument, um, longstanding argument uh, between the, the projects and the in-Delta water users because uh, most of the in-Delta water users claim riparian status. And the argument is that in these summer months, especially in the drier years, that they're diverting previously stored water that they don't have a right to. Um, this, this dispute has been going for over 40 years. Uh, I don't know if it'll be resolved in the next 40 years, but it's, it's a longstanding dispute. Um, hey, Justin? Yes. I have a question. How, how, are, uh, how, is, uh, how are riparian rights measured and how are they regulated? Are they, uh, uh, do they have a, a right to a certain amount and how is that regulated? Yes, it's unless it's adjudicated, it is not, um, there is no face value, in other words. Uh, it is limited by, by what's reasonable. It is limited by uh, beneficial use. Um, and to the last bullet here, the right is correlative. What that means is in times of shortage, all riparians should share in that shortage. So while normally they may divert 100%, uh, in light of a water shortage, they may have to be reduced to 80%, but they're all reduced proportionately. Who, 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 are, the, who are the water police for that? Neighbors. Yeah, neighbors, neighbors. yeah that, that's actually a gap in the system. Um, it's, it, in some areas, the, the rights are adjudicated, but that's a very limited subset of, of California's uh, stream systems in uh, in the delta where the the majority of riparian water use occurs. Um, there's a an office of the state water board of the delta water master, and and theoretically they're tasked with, uh, you know, as a water master would be in regulating the diversions. But um, there has not been a correlative reduction yet, to my knowledge, at least in the delta. Um, so th this is an area where, you know, we're, we're living through climate change and uncertainty and shortage. Uh, this is an area where I think the law needs to develop and come up with a way to fairly um, and consistent with uh, what the law requires to reduce riparians in times of shortage. And who, who determines uh, what is reasonable? The neighbors? Well. We'll get into this a little bit later, but what is reasonable depends on the circumstances and what's reasonable at one one time or, or one one year may not be reasonable the next year. Um, and that's because, you know, what's reasonable in a flood year, a wet year, may be totally different than what's reasonable in a drought year. So it's it's a moving scale, I would say. And uh, and it depends on the specific facts of the case. So the last. So Dustin, yes, go ahead. Sorry, Dustin. Um, so we have some streams that flow through natural streams that flow through NID district or you know surf geographic area, and do property owners next to those streams have the right to pull water from that stream because of the riparian rights or is that um i mean what the, how is that viewed because i've i've heard property owners talk about that and say that they're not allowed to actually take water out of these streams so it seems in contrast to riparian rights okay so this this has happened numerous times and it will continue to happen it, occasionally yes there are legitimate riparian claims to water within the district i would say on balance uh, folks that assert a riparian claim don't actually have a riparian right and the reasons for that are one they may be adjacent to 
a man-made ditch, one of our man-made facilities. And a riparian right does not attach to a man-made ditch. Um, second, and, and this is a big one, riparian rights only are for natural flow. And because NID system, you're importing water. And in many cases, it's not only is it imported, but it's also previously stored. So uh, you have to think what, think, put yourself in what would have existed in the state of nature. And if a landowner in the state of nature uh, has property that's immediately adjacent to a natural water course, and that natural water course would have water in it at that time of year, then yes, they would have a riparian right. But in NID's case, in most cases that, 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 that does not exist, that unique set of facts does not exist. Thank you. Final point on this slide, and this is an important one. Um, you cannot store water with a riparian water right. And um, I define storing water as holding it for more than 30 days. So uh, this, is, this is an important fact to put in the back of your mind. Um, I, you know, NID is a pretty large landowner within the district as, as the board is well aware. And we may, I haven't, I haven't studied this, but we may have through that land ownership, some um, latent unused riparian uh, water rights. Um, but just because let's, let's imagine that the district did in fact have a, an unused riparian water right given its land ownership. That does not mean that we could build a reservoir and use that uh, unused riparian water right for a new storage facility. Um, it just, we can't use a riparian water right in that manner. We would need, we would need an appropriative water right for that. Okay, are we ready? We have, uh, I think we have one more question uh, before we move off this topic. So it's from Mr. Feldman in the chat. Are there priorities of riparian rights for agriculture, habitat, sustainability, or other uses? And I think you kind of just touched on it. Yeah, they're basically they're all equal in priority. There is no preference as as to the purpose of use of a riparian water right. Um, so uh, I happen to be me personally. I'm a riparian water right holder. Um, and I, uh, there are times when I decide to keep my water in stream for the benefit of the in stream aquatic species. Um, and there are times when I decide to divert for off stream purposes. Um, and that the law considers those equal in, in priority. And again, in times of shortage, the, uh, the right would be, the right is correlative. So it would be reduced proportionately. Everybody would get the same haircut. Okay, next slide, I think is the test. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> All right. So here we have a, a water course and we have parcels A, B, and C. Um, the, the question for the class is which parcel or parcels are riparian? B and C. B and C. Is that a man made ditch? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, where, where is that water coming from? <laughs> is it stored water? Can you, you tell us what season that is? Yes, you're doing great. Uh, so let's assume this is a natural body way. There's no storage facilities, no imported water. So this is natural flow in the system. Um, so yes, B, well, C is definitely a riparian parcel they can divert and use water on parcel C. Uh, parcel B is a bit of a trick. You see the mountain range? <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I have tried to depict a different watershed because a mountain range would typically mean that, that the, the water that is shed from that uh, mountain range would go to a different watershed. So you could divert and use water on parcel B as a riparian right holder, but you could not divert that water to the other side of the mountain range. That would be moving it to an area outside the watershed and the riparian water right does not allow that. Um, the, the last nuance here is parcel A. 
Do you see that dotted line there? This is a principle called severance. And um, this happened all over California, you know, over, over the years. You started with large parcels that uh, in this case adjoined a, a, a waterway. At one time, that was a large riparian parcel. But because it was split at some point, um, the, the, the principle of severance would mean that A has severed its riparian status. So C keeps it, but A is no longer considered riparian. Now, there, there are some exceptions here, but in general, if there's a parcel split, um, the parcels that are split off that are severed from the riparian watercourse are no longer a riparian status. Any questions on that? No, we do have one question from Mr. Wallen in the chat. Is tailwater at the end of a canal considered abandoned water? And can a person have a riparian right to that abandoned water if they're downstream from the released tailwater? Yeah, that that's a graduate level question. <laughs> um, the answer is that we're graduate. Yeah, it, it depends. It is the is the diversion to the ditch, diversion of natural flow, um, and the tailwater is just re, you know, uh, re putting back into the natural stream system the natural flow that was diverted, or is it imported flow? Um, so the, the there's no not a definitive answer. It, it could be, but it also most likely would not be uh, eligible for our riparian diversion. Okay, next slide. All right. I think we're good. Good. So now we're going to get into appropriation. Oh, start, Dustin, one second. We have one more question from Director Peters. Sorry about that, Dustin. Um, do we exercise any riparian rights? Do, so we do use up in the upper watershed. Oh, we and have three strictly riparian rights, and we have two that are both riparian and pre-1914 water share this, we have to coordinate with other people on those streams to not take more than our share of it, or how do we manage those? Well, they're more where we take uh, the riparian rights, to understand them. Two of them are up in Jackson Meadows. Uh, one's a spring, one's a tributary to Pass Creek that's used for the campgrounds. So it's only a small portion of the water that's used for treating for domestic uses. Um, the other one is uh, a repairing right on the Bear River, which just passes water through the system past Comby um, with our Comby North and Comby South powerhouses. So there is no removal in that situation. The other two are also dealing with power and it's returned to the system. There is no diversion. Shall All right, I think we're, yeah, we are ready to proceed. Okay, so now we're um, going to spend some time talking about appropriative rights. Um, the, the basic principle here is you can um, use water by putting it to beneficial use regardless of the location. So you can uh, divert the water, put it into a pipe or a ditch, and uh, use it on, on other parcels. This is the uh, prevailing rule in most of the Western United States, um, which happens to be uh, more of a Mediterranean or arid type climate as compared to the Eastern United States. Uh, next slide. Justin, quickly, is there any limitation on the definition of beneficial use? So are there some uses of water and what are those that yes. are not everybody's taking their head that yes that there are but what what is a non-beneficial use we we will actually get to that um i okay. don't know if it's the next slide but shortly we will get to that thank you um okay so i found this picture um well let me let me start by introducing this so california became a state in in 1850 and the first legislature legislative session was 1851. They passed something called, called the California Practice Act and uh, dealt with water 
And uh, basically, it's it it's kind of funny to me. It, it basically the state said, keep doing what you've been doing, miners. Um, the the customs usages and or regulations of the mining location governs the the control of water rights. Um, so this principle of first in time, first in right, with appropriative rights, came out of the mining camps and uh, obviously pre statehood. And then this law in 1851 basically said, keep doing what you've been doing. So the customs usages or regulations of the mining location governs. Um, this picture is actually, uh, I got it offline, but it, it, it uh, is from the Dutch flat area and it depicts an appropriation for hydraulic mining, which, uh, so it had to have been sometime before 1884 because hydraulic mining was outlawed by the state of California in 1884. But this just shows how devastating um, hydraulic mining was to the, to the hillsides. And then actually what, what uh, really precipitated the outlawing of hydraulic mining was that the Delta was filling up with sediment. It was causing huge, huge uh, ecological and, and economic impacts downstream. Uh, next slide. So you had this uh, basically custom usages and practices of the mining caps from 1851 until the civil code was passed in 1872. And uh, it it codified basically the traditions and the practices developed in the mining camps. Um, and then it added a procedure for the appropriation of water. So uh, you would start that appropriation by going to where you wanted to divert water and you'd post a notice in a conspicuous place. And that notice had to include uh, how much, how many inches of water you wanted under four inch pressure. So a lot of times this was posted to a tree or the, you know, they'd stab a stake in the ground and put the notice there. And then within 10 days, this notice that was posted also needed to be recorded with the county recorder. Uh, many of the counties in, uh, especially in Northern California have what's called a water book. And they're fascinating to look at if, if you ever wanna go look at them. Uh, the water book, contains all of these 10 day notices that uh, the, the appropriators posted. Um, and then within 60 days of this uh, 10 day notice, you had to then commence construction and proceed diligently and uninterruptedly to completion unless temporarily interrupted by snow or rain. That's just funny to me. Um, this was obviously before the days of CEQA and, and uh, environmental analysis. So emphasis was put on diligence. And if you, if you were not diligent in, um, in following through with what your notice said, then you could lose your priority. And you would have to then repost, restart the process basically. And of course, when you're first in time, first in right, your data priority goes back to the posting of the notice. So if you've, if you've not been diligent, then you may have missed out on the months or years of your priority. Any questions there? Next slide. Okay, so the next significant event in the law of appropriation is what's called the Water Commission Act, which was uh, uh, made, uh, enacted on December 19th, 1914. So this is where you come up with pre-1914 water rights versus post-1914 water rights. This is the, uh, the benchmark uh, from which you measure pre or post. Um, it created the, what is now called the State Water Resource Control Board that regulates water quality and water rights. And it, it made the process to acquire a water right much more formal. Um, at, a, at a very high level, there's an application, um, there's a permit issued, and then a permit to license. Um, of course, there's some intermediate steps 
So, you know, the process again at a high level is let, let's just say I wanted to apply for a water right today. I would um, make that application, submit it to the water board. There's a, a public notice process where the water board notices the, uh, the public. There's an opportunity to submit what's called a protest. Um, protest uh, does not necessarily mean opposition. It, it, in, many, in many cases, it does mean opposition, but a protesting uh, person could just be somebody that's interested in tracking the project. Um, the, the, those protests are then addressed through a hearing process that uh, the water board functioning much like a court would uh, conduct a hearing and resolve those protests. Um, this is also between application and permit where uh, there's an obligation to comply with CEQA. If the applicant is a public agency, then they are the lead agency. Uh, if the applicant is a private party, private party parties are not subject to CEQA. In that case, the water board would be the lead agency. So there's quite a bit of, of intervening steps between application and permit. But uh, assuming you, you get through all those steps, then a permit is issued to you. And that permit is really just words on a paper. You then need to go develop um, your your diversion. And that could be um, plumbing into a stream. It could be uh, constructing storage facilities. There's, there's quite a bit of uh, public works involved in um, between permit and actually using water. And there's a diligence requirement here. You, in other words, California law disfavors kind of a hoarding or a, a, it's also called cold storage. You can't just hold a permit and never develop the actual diversion. Um, the uh, California law basically says, use it or lose it. If you don't wanna develop the water right, then lo lose it and somebody else may wanna develop it given that it's a limited resource. Um, once you've uh, developed uh, use under the permit, uh, let's just say for purposes of discussion, the permit authorizes 10 CFS diversion and you've constructed the diversion facility, you've got um, a ditch or a pipeline to your place of use, and you've developed the water right, meaning you, you are using 10 CFS. Then the process is to go from permit to license, which confirms that you've, almost like you've perfected your use under the permit. Um, I happen to have a client that has a 1916 permit. And I, I, for the life of me, cannot understand why they have a 1916 permit because that's, that's, that's an oddball, right? You have 1914 on when uh, permits are being issued and the, the system is designed to go from permit to license. So to have a permit that is dated 1916 is just odd. And we're actually trying to go to license on that 1916 permit. Any questions? I don't have questions. You go ahead, Laura. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I know that on the um, Rollins raise a while back, they did. So if, if, the, if you have a permit, doesn't the water board tell you you have to go complete your project within a time certain? Or you lose it, or do you lose that if you don't? If they tell you you need to do it by, you know, six years hence, and you don't do it by six years hence, do you still keep that permit active, or what happens then? Uh, if well, in general, uh, Director Peters, yes. If you have done nothing, you would lose the permit, and and there is it's it's a diligence requirement. So if you are not showing diligence, you would lose the permit. And it just goes back on file and you can apply again and restart the process. Um, there, there is a, a potential to request an extension of time. So let's say, again, back to my hypothetical, your permit says you can divert 10 CFS, but you've only developed usage to five CFS and you believe that there's gonna be growth and, and increased water demand. So you can request an extension of that permit. It's usually, 20 to 25 years is the max length of extension. 
where you can try to develop further use under, um, under the terms of the permit. And then again, eventually the goal is to go from permit to license once you uh, utilized um, or developed your, your permitted right. And it may be, uh, it may be at, the, at the end of the extension period that yeah, you've grown, but you're still not quite to 10 CFS. But nonetheless, the water board may say, no, nope, this we, we don't believe you're going to continue to grow. This is it. So um, you may have to go to license on eight CFS rather than the full 10 under your permit. And that's OK. That's OK, it, it, especially if you're in agreement that you're there's no need for that extra two CFS under my hypothetical. So if, if, if it does go back in the general pool, you can reapply and just start over provide and show that the water is still available for appropriation? Yes, in theory, Director Peters, but in, in practice, the Water Board no longer issues uh, permits. <laughs> I, I, I'm not aware of the Water Board issuing a permit, at least in the Bay Delta watershed, in years. Um, since 1965, I don't quote me on these numbers, but since 1965, I believe there's only been 115 permits issued uh, in the Bay Delta watershed. So it, it used to be, you know, um, in the teens, 19 teens, 20s, and 30s, even into the, even into the 40s, where um, the predecessor state agency to the state water board would issue permits um, fairly routinely, but um, many stream systems in California are now considered fully appropriated, meaning there is no available water uh, for appropriation. And then just the, the recognition that, um, that appropriations can have a detrimental effect on um, the downstream aquatic environment. So it's, it's more and more difficult to, uh, if not impossible, to secure a permit from the State Water Board. Uh, Dustin, uh, Director Heck also has a question. Um, I'm really fascinated bringing this back to the NI, to NID's um, water rights. So I, I'm aware, and I know we'll get to it, that we have a number of pre-1914 water rights. So looking at your prior slide, between 1872 and this 1914 date where people would post a notice and so on, now NID didn't do that. Did we acquire those water, those pre-1914 rights by purchasing them from the people who put a notice on a tree or whatever or what it they did? I, I mean, how did we get them? Oh, and everybody's we shaking your hand. We purchased them. We purchased them. We purchased them. And did we, prior to 1914, ever go out and try to put a notice on our tree ourselves under the we opportunity? Were yeah. yeah. Uh, and okay, wait. We weren't, I, three, no, we weren't an entity prior to 1914. No, I know, but I just the, wondered, do the posting. There was like some, Most yeah. of our rights have been obtained from PG&E, Excelsior, and the railroad. Yes, correct. Most right. of the pre-1914 rights were developed by mining companies, uh -huh. which were either purchased or bought by PG&E and or NID, and along with those purchases came with the water rights. Yeah. That is well, read in the history book. Yeah, that is yeah. fascinating. It's all in there. So we have all these great, like, the notices on a tree. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow, okay, thank you. That was very cool. Sorry <laughs> that today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're ready to proceed. Okay. All right. Components of a water right. Now, this this applies to both P, uh, pre and post water rights, post nineteen fourteen water rights. Um, you have what's called a point of diversion, and then points of rediversion. The think of the point of diversion as the spot where you're. Uh, taking the water from its natural course. So a lot of times this is the confluence of our ditch with the, with the natural uh, water body. It could also, there's a lot of times there's a diversion dam where we, uh, you know, stack up the water, create a little head and then push water into a ditch. Uh, a point of rediversion is, uh, an, an example of that would be if you take that water, divert it from 
the natural stream, and then you uh, somewhere down ditch, you put it into a storage facility. That would be considered a point of rediversion. And uh, Tor, I believe, will go through some of these in greater detail. You, you have perhaps the most complex uh, system of diversion and rediversion and imported water uh, of anyone in the United States. Um, next, you have a place of use. That's where you can apply the water. Uh, purpose of use uh, are things like irrigation, uh, hydropower, um, municipal, you know, domestic. Um, but each water right uh, will have a, a purpose of use. And then water rights also have a season of diversion. Now that could be January 1 through December 31st, or in other words, all year round. Or in uh, some of the post 14 rights, it'll have a uh, something less than that. It'll say like, for example, it'll say October 1 through June 1 is your season of diversion. That, that would be a typical storage right. Um, and then for post-1914 water rights, not pre-1914 water rights, you would have conditions uh, that are imposed. And there are a whole host of conditions. Um, and as you, the, the more junior the water right, that is the more recent in time it is, the more conditions there are because the state um, has started imposing things to address uh, the public trust, a reserved authority regarding public trust or waste and unreasonable use and those types of things. So let me uh, talk briefly about, there, there's an important distinction between uh, pre-14 and post-14 rights. Uh, with a pre-1914 water right, you can change these terms. You can make changes to the point of diversion, the place of use, the purpose of use, the season of diversion, and so on. The, the really only uh, legal qualifier is that you, you have to demonstrate that there's no injury to a legal user of water. So an example of that would be if you change the place of use way downstream and there's an intervening landowner or a water right holder that uh, is, is, is suffering a loss of water because of that change in place of, uh, place of use or purpose of use, uh, or excuse me, point of diversion. Um, so you can make um, quite a few changes to a pre-14 right. They're more flexible, more valuable uh, from the perspective of the district. Uh, there, I should mention that um, you, know, you would have a CEQA obligation if you made a change. Um, but in terms of water right law, it's pretty light. Compare that with making changes to a post-1914 water right. Uh, you are uh, making a petition for change to the state water board. Uh, and it's, it can be an ex expensive and a, um, a lengthy process. Uh, there's a distinction between what's called a temporary change, which is one year or less, uh, versus a, uh, a long-term change, which is more than one year. Um, this comes into play a lot with water transfers. If, uh, if the district, or maybe we just use other parties, because there are frequent water transfers that occur in California, and the way you implement a water transfer uh, with a post-1914 water right is through a petition for change at the state water board. And almost all of those transfers utilize the temporary change provisions of the water code. That's one year or less. Um, so if there's a seller in Northern California um, selling to someone south of the Delta, they would petition the water board to change the place of use, change, you may need to change the, the purpose of use. And then you would also change the points of diversion and rediversion to allow for that buyer located south of the Delta to temporarily use that water right. Any so we have a quick question. Yeah, we have one quick question in the chat from Mr. Fisher. Do NID water rights specify the percentages or volume of use for hydro, ag, domestic, et cetera, or are these purposes simply listed as an acceptable purpose on a water right? Uh, I can answer that, Dustin. Yeah, go ahead. Um, 
And the purposes are just generally listed as acceptable purposes. There is not a percentage associated with power or domestic or irrigation. Uh, rather, it's just listed as accepted purposes. Hold on that, I have another question. Um, so not only the purpose, but for, for post or pre-14, do you have to report on the diversion amount, how much you divert or how much you store? Do you have to keep track of that? And is there reporting? And is that for both pre-14 and post-14? That's correct. It's for both pre-14 and post-14. We do have to report on diversion amounts. And if you want a good idea of what the reporting looks like, because I found that reviewing the actual reports that are submitted provides a lot of context to the water right itself and how it is implemented across the state, um, you can go on to the State Board's website and under each water right there's a separate link that says documents. And if you click on that, you can go and look at the previous reports. Because a lot of times we get questions, do you have to report um, irrigation use by crop type and the you know the answer is no that's not required we're not currently required to report diversion use of diverted water by beneficial use type you're only required to essentially report what the beneficial use or purpose of use that was stated in the water rate. So if you go on the website, I think it'll give you a good context and I can send the link out well, to you. Well, and the link is in the slides. Yeah. The link is in the slides, correct. Okay, are we ready for the next slide? Okay, Director Hull, this goes back to your question. Uh, there's a number of slides where we'll go through some limits on all water rights. The first is beneficial use. Um, beneficial use is uh, the use of water necessary for the survival or well being of men, plants, and wildlife. It's defined by law and, and the State Water Board, and um, it's an evolving list. Uh, there are many, many beneficial uses. There are um, consequently some things that aren't considered beneficial uses, at least not yet. Uh, but I've listed some of the more common examples uh, on the slide here. Um, one, one example of a, a more recent recognized beneficial use is uh, tribal, um, a recognition that tribal practices, uh, tribal fishing, those uh, ought to be recognized as a beneficial use. So it's an evolving uh, definition um, and uh, it's a requirement. You cannot divert and use water for non-beneficial use. It has to go to a beneficial use. Any questions? So, so this is so broad. I mean, I, I'm thinking, okay, so what would be a non-beneficial use? And the only thing I came up with was washing my car. So, I mean, that's under domestic. Well. That's under domestic. Okay, well, um, what is a non beneficial use? Yeah, I, I can't think of one offhand. I mean, it, that's why I gave the tribal example because up until a handful of years ago, um, you know, for example, a lot of the tribes have uh, cultural practices associated with. Um, fishing and, and the salmon runs. And that cultural practice was not recognized as a beneficial use. Um, so, you know, th there was recognition that, that that was something that needed to be addressed. And the water board went through a process to then modify the definition of beneficial use to include that. So, uh, you know, offhand, is there one, I, I can't think of one, frankly, that where there's a recognized water use but it's not a recognized beneficial use. Now, well, it was not compliant to wastewater, right? Because then the question of it being beneficial to the use identified would be called in question. Yes, I, I, I can say all of NID's water practices are applied to beneficial use. Um, and if, yeah. if we became aware of a situation, um, again, I'm struggling thinking of a hypothetical here, but a customer was using water in a way that we thought was not beneficial. 
um, our, our rules would then kick in and we would um, discontinue that customer's use of that, of that particular use of water. I think we have one quick, you wanna go first, Rich? Either way. Um, so Dustin, I, I've been told that water rights associated with the consumptive use of water. Yes. Can you elaborate? Yeah. I, I, mean, I have to be use, whereas sometimes when you have in-stream flows, uh, but they're not being consumed, just passing through, that wouldn't necessarily generate a water right. Yes, and okay, so I, I think I understand your question. Um, and, and it gets into the distinction between a riparian right and a appropriative right. So with a riparian right, you can exercise that right by deciding to leave it in stream. That is a valid use of a riparian water right. Um, and it's not subject to forfeiture or loss of your water right for non-use. Um, you cannot, so now switching over to the appropriative system, you cannot, by nature of the, the definition of an appropriative right, you cannot go apply for an appropriative right to leave the water in stream. The, the law just, it, it's, it's a nonsensical sit, uh, situation because you're not appropriating by definition. But the law does recognize, um, it's 1707 of the water code, where you can, uh, dedicate either all or a portion of your appropriative water right back to in-stream uh, use. And um, it, it's, it's done, the 1707 is a, uh, is a statutory provision, there's a process involved, um, and it's a way to uh, dedicate a water right for in-stream use without uh, concerning yourself with forfeiture or loss of use. So there, there is a principle in water law where if you don't utilize an appropriative right for a period of five years, it could be uh, for, considered forfeited. Which is a good segue into a question we've got from Mr. Michael Ross. This is a question which is also connected to part three of the presentation, but stems from slide 13. I ask it now. In slide 13, title limitations on all water rights beneficial use, we are informed that use is the water necessary for the survival or well-being of man, plants, and wildlife, along with a list of examples. In all the information provided for existing water rights, starting on slide 18, title part 3, NID water rights, there are no beneficial uses listed for plants, fish, or wildlife under the column purpose. Is it possible under water right laws to change the list of purpose of our existing water rights to include plants, fish, and wildlife? So if we were to change our purpose of use for any one of our specific water rights, would that require a change position with the state board? If it was a post-1914 water right, yes. If it's a pre-1914 water right, you have to, in ID as a public agency, would have to assess uh, CEQA. And then we would need to assess whether there's injury resulting from the change to any other legal user of water. Okay, I have another trivia question here. <laughs> Is aquifer replenishment considered a beneficial use? <laughs> uh, yes and no. The law is a little vague on this, and it depends on who you're asking. In my opinion, yes. Uh, in the opinion of some of my colleagues in Southern California, water lawyers down there, they would say no, that that is not a beneficial use. Uh, but it, in the era of Sigma and unsustainable groundwater subbasins, in my view, it, it is a beneficial use and it, the law ought to recognize it clearly as a beneficial use. So we have one more comment from Mr. Ross. Um, this is just a comment. Non-beneficial use would be spraying water in the air for fun, unless it's for a slip and slide. Maybe. Uh, I, think I, I think I have an example. Uh, Chip, didn't we have an application for a person that wanted to run water down the uh, Grounds Lake Ditch into uh, 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 Tributary Wolf Creek just for aesthetic purposes? Yes. And we turned it down? Yes, that's correct. That's, and, that's a good one. There, there's one. Yeah, that's a great example. And, we, we, and as we, we just declined to sell water to that person, didn't we? We, we, we did. We made some uh, other arrangements for sales on the on the creek for irrigation purposes. Right. 
But again, I think that Dustin just touched on the fact that we have a list of beneficial uses for which our water rights should be used for and, and for replenishment of a dry stream is not one of those uses. Right. We have another good, I find very interesting question. With such an inclusion of survival or well-being for plants and wildlife, along with estimated rates and volumes, be added to the rates and volumes for existing purposes listed, could that demonstrate the basic need for additional water rights? So could you substantiate non-forfeiture of your water rights if you're not using them all by demonstrating that you are using them all for beneficial use of wildlife? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think you could. And forfeiture, forfeiture gets really complex because there's a period of contiguous non-use five years, as I mentioned. And then there's also a question of intent. Um, so it, it gets pretty fact specific and uh, technical in nature. But I would, for the, the basic premise, yes, I would agree with that uh, statement. No more questions in the chat. All right, next slide, please. Okay, the next uh, limit is a thing called usufructory. You, know, you need to be very careful when you say that or how quickly you say it. Right? <laughs> um, usufructory is a, is a type of property interest and water is one of these usufructory rights. So it's a right to use water, but you don't actually own the molecules of the water. The state owns the molecules of the water. Um, so this, this comes up in a couple contexts. Um, first, water, a water right is a property right. And because it's a property right, uh, it's, it's a right to use, yes, but it's still a recognized property right, no different than uh, any other real property, your, your house or your lot where you may live. And because it's recognized as a property interest, um, the uh, takings clause in the US and state constitution would apply. So your water right cannot be taken without just compensation. And I've quoted um, this, this is a very famous case, United States versus State Water Resource Control Board. Um, in, in my uh, water law lingo, this is called the Racinelli decision. It's, I don't know, somewhere north of 100 pages of pretty dense legalese, but uh, there is a very good summary of California water law and principles of California water law. So if anybody's ever interested in wanting to learn more about this, this would be a good place to start. And you could just Google this case or the Racinelli decision and, and um, enjoy the reading. Uh, the second Second area where I think this is important is Justin, this. One second. Yes. We're, we're having a request for a spelling. Racinelli? Racinelli? Oh. Uh, I believe it's R-A-C-A-N-E-L-L-I. Racinelli was the judge that presided over this case. So the, uh, the next reason why this, this usufructory right is important is because uh, the public retains a significant interest in water resources. Because the state owns the molecules and NID as a water right holder only um, owns the use or, or has a right to the use of that water, it means there's a, there's a public interest dynamic that um, the state retains that we should always be um, conscious of in our decision-making. Uh, next slide, please. Dustin, could you elaborate on that statement? And I mean, I, I really, to be honest, we have a right to use the water, but the state owns the molecules. What the heck? I mean, what's the... It's the public interest. Maybe, Dustin, maybe you can describe what, what does that mean, there's a public interest? Yeah, so this comes up mostly in, in our interfaces with the State Water Board. Almost everything the State Water, Door, Water Board does requires them to assess the public interest. Um, 
so that, that's a bit of a nebulous concept, right? And, and what's, uh, how I would define the public interest is probably differently than, than others would define the public interest. And it evolves with time. Um, the public interest in the 1950s and 1960s, the, you know, the World War II generation, was to go out and build storage facilities. I mean, that, that was the public interest, is to get as much water diverted into storage as possible and build these projects. Well, that, I would say, and I hope most everybody would agree, that, that that's no longer representative of the public interest today. Um, there are some that would say it is, but I would say that's not a widely held belief, not as widely held as it was in the 1950s and 60s. So um, the Water Board is tasked with um, assessing is this issue of water rights, and that could be a change petition for a water transfer. It could be um, a decision on an application for a permit. It could be in the context of the State Water Board's Water Quality Control Plan Amendment. Um, but they're looking and assessing is this in the public interest? And this is where um, it's very important for the public to engage the water board on these questions because it's really the public uh, perspectives feeding into the process that helps the water board then assess and gauge whether the uh, proposal is in the public interest. Um, does that help? I, there's not a precise definition, but because it's an evolving concept. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, go back. How could I miss the public trust doctrine? Uh, this is a big one. Um, so this is a limitation on all water rights. And it actually has ancient origins. It's, a, it's something out of ancient Roman law. It's uh, been asserted to protect public rights in commerce, navigation, fisheries. Um, the, the State Water Board in particular is required to consider the impact of appropriations or use of water on public trust resources. Uh, the, it's, it's a balancing type test where um, you're assessing the need to divert water versus the impact on the public trust resource. And uh, there's an obligation to mitigate the impact to the public trust resource to the extent you can. Um, there's a very famous case, it's National Audubon. It was decided in 1983 by the uh, state Supreme Court. Uh, it involved the Mono Lake, um, Mono Lake and LA's diversions of, I believe it was four tributaries into the Mono Lake and they diverted basically 100% of the flow that would have otherwise gone into Mono Lake. And they'd been doing this for years. They'd been issued a permit and, and they may have even had, had licensed those permits. Um, but this litigation basically says, no, State Water Board, you need to reconsider even your past decisions in light of an impact on the public trust uh, resource. In this case, it was Mono Lake. Um, one other uh, point here is, you know, occasionally you, you should question what is navigable because the public trust doctrine only applies to something that is considered a navigable uh, water body. Uh, but basically the, the law has evolved on that, that almost anything is considered navigable. I think if you could put a kayak in it, it's considered navigable. Any questions on that one? Next slide, please. Okay, the next limit on all water rights is uh, what's called waste and unreasonable use. It is a uh, amendment to the California Constitution housed in Article 10, Section 2. Uh, it was enacted in 1928. And in broad terms, it prohibits the waste, unreasonable use, unreasonable method of use, and unreasonable method of diversion of water. Um, this is this again. Uh, we spoke about this earlier, but it's it's an assessment of the totality of the circumstances. 
and what is reasonable at one time and place may not be reasonable at other times and places. So when water is plenty in those wet years, you may, able to, you may, may be able to use water uh, in a way that is uh, perfectly fine, but in a, in a critical year or dry year, maybe that same exact use would be considered unreasonable. Um, the last bullet point is historically, uh, what is considered waste or unreasonable use was determined by an adjudicatory process, either litigation or a water right proceeding. That has evolved um, in really uh, in the last 15 years um, to where the state water board is now uh, defining waste and unreasonable use through a legislative process, either standard rulemaking or even emergency rulemaking. And um, full disclosure, I, I do not like uh, the state water board legislating waste and unreasonable use. I, I think that is extremely bad public policy. I think it um, interjects uncertainty into our water rights system. Um, but there are many, many people that would disagree with me. Um, and also full disclosure, my office is, is and has been involved in litigation challenging the state water board's use of emergency regulations to define waste and reasonable use. Um, the reason, I, I think it's a slippery slope. So um, would, you, would you like me to give you the example or would you like me to stop there? I, I can I could go for a while on this particular point. Well, I'd like an example, but I'm also looking at the time. Yeah. So I don't know. You Wait, guys, so you know. this is this is for the public and the board to learn and understand as much as you need to. So if we need to add a meeting, we will just add a meeting because we also have a really good breaking point coming up. So we can make a decision and do, you know, the next meeting maybe an hour and we can finish it up. So ask your questions. This is okay, well, for I'd your like, knowledge. I'd like to take Dustin up on his offer and listen to what the example is. I don't know if do anyone it. else interested. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think it can't, can't be as scary as what we're thinking. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually an emerging area of water law. This, this area of uh, the state defining waste and unreasonable use by regulation. Um, and the example that is currently has been litigated and is currently in a new round of litigation um, has to do with Mill and Deer Creek. They are tributaries to the Sacramento River. They're extremely important for um, spring run salmon. And they also have water users that have some of the oldest water rights in the state of California. They, um, Peter Lassen, uh, you know, founded that area and appropriated water. So it was pre-statehood. So um, what the water board did first in, in 2014, yes, 2014, and then again in 2014, and then again in 2021, is they said it is a waste and unreasonable use to divert water in a way that uh, would interfere with an in-stream flow regime and a pulse flow regime. So what, what they tried to do is they, they established an in-stream flow as a preferred use of water. And then they said anything, any off-stream diversions that interfere with that in-stream flow requirement would be considered waste on a reasonable use. Um, so the, the reason, so there's no assessment of the off-stream use, uses. There's no assessment of how efficient they are in their water use practices. Um, it's, a, it's establishing a preference for in-stream flow at the expense of another recognized beneficial use. So there isn't this balancing that's, that in my opinion ought to be considered. Um, yes. Couldn't they say that about any, any stream anywhere? Yes, and so that's my point about um, public policy. The, so this is five appointed members of the state water board that are making this decision. They're, they're not elected officials, they're appointed. 
Um, and it's their preferences. So their preference in right now might be in stream flow. But what if the preference 20 years from now is off stream diversion and it's waste and unreasonable use not to divert water? So you see how the, the preferences of the decision maker uh, can change over time. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's poor policy. If, if you want to legislate waste and unreasonable use, it ought to be the legislature where they're accountable to the electorate. Um, so, but that's, those are some of my, my personal opinions on this. And obviously this is an emerging, emerging area of water law. This, this becomes important when we get to another slide. Um, we, we, and I'll, I'll briefly preview it here, but we have talked in this boardroom about the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan update and the unimpaired flow concept. And if the water board moves forward with that, um, remember the amendment to the water quality control plan is not self-implementing. It's just words on a paper. The water board then needs to go into an implementation phase. Um, historically, that implementation phase was a adjudicatory process, a water rights proceeding, where everybody would go to the water board and it would be like a trial. We'd uh, present our vintage of water rights and why um, our use is necessary and reasonable um, to continue. And other folks, other water right holders would do the exact same thing. And then after everybody had their day in court, the water board would make a decision. Um, what the water board is indicating is they're going to dispense with that kind of cumbersome adjudicatory process, which it is cumbersome. It's, it's many, many days of hearings before the water board. And Instead of doing that uh, water right proceeding, they're uh, suggesting that they may uh, enact a regulation or emergency regulation to implement the water quality control plan. And again, I just think that's, that's poor policy and it, uh, it also doesn't respect the priority system. You know, everything we've been talking about depends on priority and our system in times of shortage, the juniors should go, should discontinue their diversions. And you keep going through the priority system until you balance supply and demand. And my concern with a legislative implementation of unimpaired flow is that it may be applied to everybody, regardless of seniority of water right. So NID having some of the more senior water rights um, in the state, would be subject to an unimpaired flow standard no differently than the most junior water right in the state. Um, so anyway, it's, there's still a lot of discussion on that, but uh, as I said, this is an emerging area of water law and it's something that um, is causing a fair amount of dispute and, and discussion, certainly. All right, so we have a couple questions in the chat that uh, dovetail nicely into this discussion right now from Mr. Michael Ross. Being that the state's water board, the legislator, and the courts can make changes to surface water rights or allocations, what current changes or likely changes to surface water rights are being discussed now in the state that should be included in the plan for water scenario planning development along with climate change? And it is a great question, and I think it's actually on Dustin's yep. next slide. Okay. We will get to that shortly. That's good timing. Yeah, there, there are several items um, that should be considered, but it does speak to a lot of the uncertainty surrounding regulations, whether it be through the FERC relicensing process, um, the desire of the water boards to have these un, um, open-ended 401 certifications through unimpaired flows, standards that could be required through the basin plan amendments that Dustin just talked about, or even through voluntary agreements. So there are a lot of kind of moving dials. Yes, um, there's a lot. There is, there is a lot. There's still a lot that's unknown. And frankly, there's a lot that's unknown about climate change. So that is why it's very important that we develop a model that is flexible in the future as we learn more data and the climate change models are updated and regulations change, that it can be simply modified as opposed to having to be completely redone. But this also speaks to the importance of kind of 
constantly keeping your models up as opposed to doing them and letting them sit on the shelf and revisiting them every five years. Right. Yeah. And then uh, Mr. Ross, and unless Dustin, did you have any more comments regarding that question? We'll discuss that further in the next slide. All right. And then we have one more um, for Mr. Ross. Are, are we looking at likely impact of advances in big data technology such as those used in remote sensing from satellite or drone imagery for what is or not reasonable use? As an example, the open ET platform and other emerging technologies in remote sensing are already having an impact on water to land surveys. And the answer is yes. Um, some of one of our challenges with remote sensing is that you know they have set, had some very good success with remote sensing operations um, specific to actual water use on a crop by crop basis in the Central Valley. And there's two things that lend that area to being successful using that technology that does not duplicate itself in our particular district. And one is that down there, they obviously have less tree cover, right? So we, have a, we do have a tree cover issue. Um, but secondly, the remote sensing technology that's currently being used, I anticipate this is going to be more advanced, you know, even the next five years technology is just advancing at such a rapid pace, is that they actually deploy small climate sensors on individual farms that are, they're going to be flying over for the remote sensory data. And that climate change on the ground, weather data that is, or climate data that is collected on the ground from those little weather station devices is used to calibrate the data that comes out of the remote sensory. And because we don't have large, you know, thousand acre farms like they do in the valley, it's just not a feasible technology at this time. And I, in fact, did, I, I did, I read an article um, in the union um, referencing that we should use land IQ for some of this effort, um, which is interesting is I actually have a really good friend whose wife works for land IQ, and I had been talking to them a few months ago about it and, and called them again to just restart the conversation because I think that they probably could have a role in our plan for water modeling effort, specifically if we start kind of breaking these pieces off. Um, but talking with the owner, Joel, um, he confirmed what I just stated, that remote sensory um, technology is probably not applicable to our district because of the small parcel size and the small farming size and the diversity of farming that is going on as well as the tree cover. But he did think that some very good work could be done um, kind of with those the book rates um, for ET as well as uh, consumption associated with different crop types. So stay tuned on that. We are looking for it, um, looking into it. And, you know, I think, like I said, even in just five years' time to date, you know, the technology is going to be. We might have flying robots who could do it for us, who knows. <laughs> or aliens. And my understanding is that it goes to quite a granular level, a quarter of an acre or something like that. And most of our agricultural pursuits are not done under tree cover. They're, they're in the open. You know, the 37,000 acres of raw water, the primary raw water is in southern Nevada County, northern Placer County. That's where the bulk of the water is used. It's much more open in those areas. Yeah, it's, it's uh, feasibility. So there, the, we don't have, you would be deploying too many small climate right. stations on too many parcels to ever get the work done to be able to calibrate the sensory model. So I spoke directly with the owner of Land IQ, and they're the, the statewide expert. Um, but like I said, I do think that they have a role probably in this effort. So, so stay tuned. Explain how we would use that, how that data would be, what benefit that data would be. I mean, are we going to tell people how much water they can buy or use on their property or that kind of stuff? Yes. That's where it goes right away. It might hit, right? Well, it does. And this gets back to the benefit of knowing that data versus managing a system and planning for a system. And I think. Um, when it moves forward, if we move forward into a very much more draconian era of curtailments and restrictions on water use and required conservation measures, then you would inherently want that data to be able to parse apart the irrigation customer class. So right now, irrigation, even in the water code, it includes agricultural use, it includes watering your Huge lawn, and your shrubs, golf courses, the whole thing. 
Now, if as time moves on, if the state tightens up the regulations, it would be advantageous to have some of that data. But from a purely um, operational management, we do not manage the system, and nobody manages any system, whether it's treated water or not, on that granular of a customer by customer basis because it's just not warranted to do because it is one connected system. So you do have to you have to understand why you're collecting the data, what you're going to be using the data for, how much you're paying for this data, and you know people do get themselves in trouble collecting data that they don't necessarily can't use and don't see the end use in it. I think that there would be. Um, Probably some consideration, you know, if I was an environmental person of wanting to know what, um, you know, if that was my, the group I was representing, uh, wanting to know what's, what water is being used for agricultural purposes versus lawn watering. And then, you know, we even hear within the agricultural community themselves, what's commercial versus yeah. hobby ag. And so I think as we move forward, this is going to become more and more important. Um, at this point, I don't think that the technology quite exists to get that granular of data within this effort, but I think we can start kind of laying the framework to be able to do that into the future. And it just speaks to the um, different priorities of different customers. And you know, we are an irrigation district, so we're here for all the customers. Right. You know, and um, we have a huge section of treated water customers that sometimes feel like they're not quite represented as well as some of the more focused stakeholder groups such as ag or the environmental community. So I just bring that to everybody's attention so we don't forget about them. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you would greatly inform our crop reports that we're required to submit. And All right. So I think that we're ready to go on, Dustin. Go ahead. Okay. We made it. Oh, let me, let's go on this one and then I'll give it. Yeah, it is talks about indigenous water rights. Yeah, um, our pre, and um, Diana and Dustin did reference on this, um, just previously might not have been part of the conversation yet. Um, Dustin, her, Diana's comment essentially states, are pre-existing indigenous water rights considered? What about rights of nature, nature's water rights? So. Remember, these are rights to divert water as opposed to the natural right, uh, the natural ability for water to be in the stream. So this speaks to appropriative rights. If you're not appropriating the water, there is no right given um, per the current law. Does not mean that's not in the future? Dustin, do you have any other input on that particular question? Yeah, and, and just that um, the limits on water rights that we spoke of, public trust, um, waste and reasonable use, those are also um, limitations in part to recognize some of the other uh, interests that she that she listed. Um, so it's it's those uh, uh, other interests, so to speak, um, are addressed in a number of different spots in in water law. Okay, and then uh, Mr. Ross, he just had a clarifying statement. Um, I think that you can easily answer, Dustin. He said one of his questions was in context of legal water right changes. Um, you know, Dustin, you might want to provide any background. You have a current efforts to change the water right process. From my perspective, it seems to be being done through a lot of different variety of regulatory processes, but you probably have a better input on it. Not understanding the question. Is this uh, changing the? Mr. Ross is he's wanting to understand if we're aware of any legal water right changes coming that would impact the plan for water process. Oh, well, yes, that's that's this slide. So why don't we? Uh, is, is there any other questions or should we? jump into this slide. Uh, Mr. Ross says, I am mixing up the context of remote sensing for farm farming and water to land use surveys. Um, we might have to have that conversation offline. I'm not quite sure what Mr. Ross is referring to. And, and then um, Mr. Macon, he states there's also likely significant difference between crop options available to NID customers versus Central Valley production. That's very true. That is true. Very true. All right. So I think we're ready to go, Dustin. Okay. So these, this is part two of our presentation. These are some of our pending water right proceedings. 
Uh, they're listed in um, chronology here. Um, first, we have a NID petition for change. So the purpose of this is to license the lower division water rights. Uh, and then there's some changes. So we wanna accurately identify current facilities, conform the place of use, et cetera. Um, next is the petition for assignment of application 5634. This is the, um, the so-called centennial water right. And I wanna um, take this opportunity to uh, remind the board and the public that this is a existing water right on the Bear River. It currently is tied to the proposed Centennial Reservoir project, but uh, that is not a necessity. It could be tied to some other project. Um, and that's an important fact for this uh, plan for water process because there's an existing water right. It's a 1927 vintage. Um, and if there's a project as part of this plan for water uh, process that, um, that the public and this board concludes is, is worth uh, further investigation, then this water right could potentially be used for that. And, and it does not have to be the Centennial Reservoir Project. It, it could be, but it does not have to be. Um, so think of this uh, water right as existing independently of the proposed Centennial Project. Um, any questions on that? Laura has one question. Um, you say it's an existing water right, but my understanding was it's a state filed application that hasn't been perfected to a license as a water right. No, the state holds the water right. We are we submitted an application to assign a portion of that water right to us. Okay, so it is an existing water right. It's not just a state filed application. It's, it's a state filed. State holds the right right now. Correct. And it, it's a and good then, question, uh, Director Peters, because this is um, there was some legislation early on in the 1920s, I believe, early 1920s. The state recognized that uh, there, there needed to be some um, order to the development of water in California. So they sent around a state engineer or maybe more than one state engineer. And the state engineer identified uh, potential uh, storage sites throughout the state. And uh, they, this legislation allowed the state, it actually directed the Department of Water Resources to uh, then uh, apply for a water right and pull a permit. Now, normally, I mentioned earlier, the normal process, once you get a permit, there's diligence and you have to construct the project. There's, a dil there's an exception to that diligence requirement for these state filed water rights. Um, they're basically just sitting there waiting for the county, the, the county or the area of origin to develop the right. Um, these water rights, these state file water rights were used to develop Orville, the state water project. They were used to develop Lake Shasta, the CVP system. Um, and there is this water right on the Bear River for what's known as the Parker Dam site. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's an existing water right permit. Uh, it's sitting there in, in cold storage, so to speak. There's no diligence requirement as of yet. But if that permit were ever to be issued, so let's say, for example, it was issued to NID for some future project, there would then be a diligence requirement once it is issued to NID. NID would have to then diligently pursue completion of whatever the project is. Um, so it's a it's it's a unique water right um, that's that's already sitting there waiting for for development by the area of origin. Could you repeat yeah. that, Dustin? What you just said? It's a unique water right waiting for development by the area of origin or the county of origin. It's probably more precise. Hey, Dustin. Oh, oh sorry. I mean, I'm just like sitting here blown away because I spent four years participating in this board uh, being told by uh, former board members that we had to absolutely do diligence 
for that water right, and the diligence at that time was defined as buying all those properties in the Bear River Canyon. And what I just heard you say, and this is why, gosh, if you could say this one more time, that at the current time, there is no uh, requirement for diligence until such time as the water right is issued. I, so we're, so we're confusing wait, the really, state's water right. The state, oh, this was one of the the, state's water so right. the state's water right, the state has its own rules. Right. We have an application submitted right. to basically transfer part of the water right. Part of that application process is that you have to substantiate that you are diligently moving forward and being responsive to any requests they have. So you, we don't conflate our application for a portion of that water right from the ability for the state to sit and have that water right in cold storage. Okay, They're two but, different things. But Not that buying the property had to be done. That was what was what. The, so Dustin, well, why don't you well, back yeah, up yeah. and explain well, that like, piece yeah. of it? Yeah, I'm sorry. I've caused some confusion. The Jennifer's correctly. Jennifer's correct. There's so we're talking about three different diligence requirements. Okay. There's a diligence requirement once the state issues a permit to then diligently initiate and complete construction, whatever construction is needed. To a uh, random third party, not their own, not their own water right. Not their own water right. And, but you but you started out by saying that this Bear River right application five six three four was a state owned water right. Yes. We are asking for a port. Okay. So there's so there we'll let Dustin proceed. But th think of them in three different separate components. The yes. state owns a portfolio of water rights, mm -hmm. one of which applies to this point of origin on the Bear River. We have now submitted. Now we're in the second path. We have submitted an application mm -hmm. to request part of that water right, not mm -hmm. the whole thing. There is a, the state has no diligence because they're really good at making their own rules legally <laughs> yeah, for themselves. Right. Now we have enter, entered into a new process where we are required to show diligence of moving forward this process. And this is why we go to the status hearings with the administrative hearing officer. So we are substantiating that we have responded to all requests and that we are moving forward with this effort. Right. Dustin, you want to talk about the third? The, the third is, you know, once the uh, permit, the application for assignment is granted and NID becomes the holder of that permit, then there's another diligence requirement to then go ahead and complete construction of whatever facilities are necessary to put the water to beneficial use. And then so, you get your license. Yes. And then following completion of, of, you know, you've developed your right under the permit, which may take many years. But once you do that, you go to license. There's a due so, diligence that has to be shown between permit, the permit, I'm going to use the water rate, I'm going to build this license is licensing what you built. Right. I have a question after you. Yeah. Justin, so if NAD were not to follow through on this application petition, who else is, a, um, who else is mm. able to apply for this water right? Any anyone can apply for a state filed water right. Um, Anybody in the, in the state of California? Can the state just go up there and build their own reservoir and add it to the state system? This water yeah, right? Yeah, theoretically, yes. I, I doubt they would, but yes, they could. Um, you know, there was an, uh, maybe ten years ago now, maybe more. Um, the the Garden Bar reservoir. That was a joint venture of uh, a sister district to downstream of NID, South Sutter Water District, and I believe Metropolitan Water District. So, um, you know, th th these state filings are uh, pretty valuable because they're, as I said, they're basically an existing water right, an existing permit um, waiting for assignment. And they have a more senior priority so, so they're valuable because they have a more senior priority. Plus, the reality is a 2022 application for a permit at the water board will either never be granted or it may be, um, you know, 100 years from now. I don't know when, but many, many years from now, by the time the state would state water board would act on it. So the reality is, if you are looking for a new water right, 
one of these state filings um, is really your only option. Uh, one clarification. So anybody in California can apply for this water right if if it's open and available. Yes, but I, I'm yes, but there are practical limits to what your question. So this is a Bear River water right. So so somebody in Southern California couldn't uh, apply for the right and then move it to the Delta or you know somewhere downstream that the state would not grant that. It, ha it has to be a de for a development on the Bear River. Um, so there are some practical limitations, but the answer is yes. Anybody can apply for one of these state filed water rights. So they could, they could build something on the Bear River or and then transfer the water? Potentially. There would be, obviously we would oppose that. There would be considerable opposition. Um, but in theory, yes. Can you speak to the county of origin, Dustin? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, you know, the reality, and I may get these figures wrong, but uh, about 80% of the precipitation falls in Northern California, and about 80% uh, of the, the demand for water is in Southern California. So the state is just naturally set up for dispute over water. And uh, early on, um, you know, the, the policymakers in the legislature recognized that you should not allow a situation where all the water is exported from the counties and areas of origin for use in Southern California. So they developed multiple protections to make sure that the area of origin, such as uh, Nevada, Placer, Sierra counties, uh, would not be dried up and and water ships south. So um, the the area of origin, county of origin protections are in a few different uh, sections of the of the water code, but uh, in these state filings, actually, there's some uh, county of origin protection. It basically says that uh, an applicant for one of these state filed water rights there's a reservation in that assignment um, that says that they cannot deprive the county of origin water that's necessary for the order to orderly development of the county. So it's almost like a lien. I, I think of it almost like a lien that if there is, let's use Director Johansson's example, um, let's say the state water project decides to build at the Parker Dam site, Centennial Reservoir and they use the state file water right, and they get through all the process. I mean, they're, they're done, right? Um, there would be a reservation in the issuance of the state file uh, water right that says that the counties of origin, Nevada, Placer, Sierra County, and so on, could basically acquire water back from this project if necessary for the orderly development of the counties. Um, so that that's one example. It's it's but again, this is this is an area where we could do a an entirely separate presentation because it it's in quite a different quite a few different uh, areas of the law. So, Mike, I guess my follow up question would be: How do you reconcile that with the state water board becoming more politically active and changing some of their focus or their priorities? And given the consideration that Southern California has all the votes. Hmm. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to have a hard time reconciling that. I'll leave that to uh, water board colleagues. Well, I, I mean, I, I think we're have. I mean, to me, that's a reality that we're seeing a lot more water move south and whether we want it or not. Oh, thank you. I have one quick question. One final, one final question from me, Dustin. Um, does it have to be a brick and mortar project that's developed, or could it be a, a suite or a portfolio of diverse actions that, that would be? Um, I think no. I think it could be multiple. You could split the water right up. In other words, multiple different points of diversion, multiple points of rediversion. Um, so. 
should I give a hypothetical? I'll give a hypothetical. This is purely hypothetical. If, if there was a, a suite of projects such as a, uh, a, a Rollins raise, a, um, a diversion uh, structure into the Bear River Canal downstream and some other things, as long as the totality of those diversions do not exceed the state filed water right, you could theoretically slice and, sp and splice that water right into multiple different um, projects, so to speak. So it has to be brick and mortar. It can't be no. groundwater replenishment or just, you know, where there's not, you're actually building something concrete and steel or anything. It has to be something built. That's well, you, I think that gets back into that gray area. Yeah. I mean, even, even if that, it is groundwater replenishment, you still need to move the water from the stream to the area of recharge. Very good. That helps. Yeah, remember your purpose of use has to be consistent with the legal beneficial uses. So this goes back to the conversation we were having at the beginning. Um, and there is, I, I don't, is there any case law that has ruled on using surface water rights for replenishment of groundwater unless it's already been treated through a plant or something? I, I, I'm not aware of any, but Dustin would be. Or environmental benefits or just any other benefits. That was just an example. Yeah, we're, we're still in the early stages of um, developing the law around recharge, groundwater recharge. There is, a, um, there is a temporary water right process. I'm not very familiar with it just because I, I have not had a client utilize it yet, but I'm generally aware um, Yolo County uh, flood control district, I believe, has gone through the process a couple times. Basically, the concept is if there's floodwaters in the system, you can divert those floodwaters, apply them to land um, as raw water. And, uh, you know, you have to have some methodology to track and account for the recharge. And then there's an accounting on the back end where you're withdrawing that water as well. But it is a temporary permit. It's supposedly expedited. It's um, it's a, it's a new concept at the water board that has you know within the since Sigma since 2014 um, has been um, enacted. So it's still pretty early in its uh, in its application. Okay, before we move off of this, with several public comments, but I think we've we've kind of touched on most of them, so I'll, I'll read through them, and if we need to add anything in, we can. Um, so from Miss Kiko, she says, regarding fungible rights, what else might uh, 5634, which is the uh, application, be used for? Are there any other project ideas? I think we just kind of touched on that. So the purpose of the plan for water is to flush out uh, future demand, any future supply that may be needed or may not be needed and then to come up with kind of that suite of ideas or potential projects to address any needs that were then identified. Um, so stay tuned for that. And I think, you know, we've all been kind of throwing around some ideas, which all can be considered in the plan for water. Then we have, um, Kiko had another question. Additionally, are there any restrictions on using 5634 for another project? Uh, Dustin just answered that question. So. You know, I think if it's consistent with the, if the purpose of use for the project is consistent with the legal beneficial uses, um, I think you'd probably be okay. But mind you, you still have to go through the whole application process, and that would change your application, right, and your CEQA requirements. Um, Mr. Feldman, we just kind of touched on this. How and when is CEQA applied or relevant to the application process? So, Dustin, it comes in at different points depending on what. So, with a... Um, any change petition for change of use or something, you're required to do CEQA, whether you're pre-1914 or not, correct? Yes. And and then, for for example, for R5634, CEQA is also required. It's basically required any time there's a change of use that then would have any type of impact on the environment, correct? Correct. Sorry, I was... Uh, we're running out of time and we're not even to our part three. Okay. If I'm talking too fast, just yell at me. What if there is not water there? So what if we were in a drought situation, Dustin, and the water 
um, that was contemplated as part of the water right just simply did not exist. Yeah, well, you can't divert what you what's not there. First of all, there's a physical impracticality um, or impossibility. Um, second, let's say the more realistic scenario is there's uh, there's a downstream party that is senior to your water right. And that's when the state water board implements the curtailment process and they uh, curtail in reverse order of priority. So the juniors, the most recent uh, permits and licenses are curtailed first and they keep curtailing back in time until uh, water supply and water demand uh, equal out. And it's a, uh, uh, I almost said fluid process. It is a fluid process, pun intended, um, because it changes on a week to week basis in years like this that are, that are dry. Um, so, you know, one week you may have a curtailment, the next week you may not, just depending on supply and demand. And this speaks to, I think, some of, um, Especially on the kind of the water agency side of the coin, some of the frustration with the proposed unimpaired flow standards associated with the Bay Delta Water Quality Plan Amendment, because it's kind of circumventing the seniority process and applying everything just across the board equally. So just to give a little context. Right. All right. Um, anonymous. Can you explain the area of origin and how that applies to the pending application? I think we just touched on that one. Dustin did a great job. Um, Diana, question, is there a problem with over allocation of water? Oh, yeah. So I, I think that's always an interesting question. Is anybody accounting for all of the water that's currently tied up in water rights plus that is in the state's portfolio of water rights that's yet to be um, licensed? So is there a water pond scheme occurring? Yeah. <laughs> there, uh, yes and no. Uh, so this is this is actually a hot button issue and depending on who you ask you would get wildly different answers um there's something again don't quote me on the numbers but there's something like 200 million acre feet that the of precipitation in an average year in california and there's not nearly that much uh water developed under water rights um that, that being said, um, there are areas of the state, in my opinion, that are overallocated um, in light of climate change, in light of, um, you know, uh, very uh, um, dire fishery issues in the Bay Delta watershed. Um, and, you know, th there may need to be some revisiting, but that's, that's why the priority system works. And um, you know, I, I always get nervous when folks talk about we got to change the water right system because um, I like the water right system. It provides certainty. Um, your communities developed around the water right system. It's, it, it, it's part of the fabric of your community. It really is. And if you start making changes to something as fundamental as uh, water rights, it could have very large impacts. And um, so I am totally in favor of the state implementing the water right system. And when folks need to be curtailed for a lawful reason, they ought to be curtailed. Um, so that's my, that's my soapbox. All right, we're getting the, to, oh. I'm just gonna, I had a point on that, um, over allotment part, that the farm river is a, one third of the water is developed or, or used by people, one third goes to the environment, one third goes out to the ocean on an average year. So that's putting it kind of in that context. I, I don't know if that's what she or she was going with that question, but that's, it's often, often, uh, you know, agriculture uses 90% of the water, and that's implied that it's 90% of what falls out of the sky, and it's not true. It's just more like 41%. Yeah, something like that. All right, um, Mr. Fisher would acquire the license on the water right at the Parker Dam project prohibit neighboring water districts from future pursuit of ga the Garden Bar project. Was the Garden Bar project based off of the same state portfolio of water rights? Yes, they were, the concept would have utilized the same uh, 
state filed water right. Okay. But that was 330,000 acre feet versus the 110. So how does that, okay. The state filed, the state water right is more than what the centennial application was filed for. Correct. All right, uh, Ms. Melinda Booth, she says she has a couple of questions that are relevant, but more general in nature that don't necessarily fit into this part of the presentation. Um, she's asking, she's asked them out, or she's happy to wait until a future meeting. I'm gonna go ahead and say, we would love to hear your questions. We are running out of time, but we're also at a really good breaking point. So um, Melinda, if they also will pertain to the second part of the presentation, we'd be more than happy to hold them over. If you don't feel that it's warranted to hold them over, just please pop out back in the chat. And then Mr. Macon, probably for a future meeting, but are there legal and or geological differences in groundwater recharge and fracture rock versus alluvial aquifer systems? And from the geological perspective, the answer is yes. From the legal perspective, um, it'd just be the regulation of the modeling you would probably have to do. I, I'm not aware of any specific groundwater regulation that's specific to fracture rock versus um, some type of sedimentary rock, are you? No. I believe that uh, defines what is a recognized basin and what is not. So Sigma recognizes the um, identified basins by um, DWR's bulletin 405 and it's the high and medium risk basins and typically you don't find any fracture rock basins in the high or medium list. Okay. The recharge areas are at the intersection of the fractured rock and the alluvial basin. Okay. Let's um all right, and then Melinda says she's happy to save her for next time, assuming you'll schedule another to finish this topic. And I think, yep. do we have a head nod? This is a real meaty topic. Dustin saw three bullets on his slide, and we have not stopped talking, specifically me. So you want to hit your last two bullets, Dustin? They could be linked. I mean, I can quickly cover them, and then we could come back to them if necessary. Um, I think, yeah. You want me to quickly cover? Yeah, quickly cover, and then I think I think we're all realizing that this is such a meaty topic that we need another meeting. Okay, so the uh, Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan update introduced this a little bit earlier. Um, there's a 2018 uh, framework document that recommends a 45 to 65 percent unimpaired flow requirement on all water rights uh, in the uh, Sacramento. It's the uh, is the Bay Delta watershed Sacramento River um, phase. So that would include an ID. And uh, the requirement would also apply year round. So uh, it's more complex than this statement, but I think of it as um, if you have a water right for 100, say 100 CFS, and an unimpaired flow requirement exists, then you cannot divert 45 to 65 CFS, depending on what the standard is. Um, so it could have very significant water supply impacts for NID. We uh, have not seen any type of environmental analysis yet, or really anything in detail, anything more than this 2018 framework document. But I will tell you that there's enough detail in this framework document to give me uh, significant concern uh, for NID. And if I, I would say, I, I defer to, to staff here, but if this came to pass where NID was subject to uh, a 45 to 65% unimpaired flow requirement, this plan for water process would need to be totally restarted because the uh, supply, water supply availability would be so. Um, so much different than what you will be assessing in the coming stages, but um, it would be just such a significant change that we would need to revisit all of our planning documents, including this process. Um, one final point here, um, because NID is, is in the area of origin, there is no reliable alternative supply. What I mean by that is there's no, there's no one upstream of you that you can except PG&E, that you can reliably buy water from to satisfy your uh, you know, 
35 to 55% of your demands. Um, there's also not a reliable aquifer. You're not sitting in the Sacramento Valley where if there is an unimpaired flow requirement that attaches to your surface water right, that you could just alternate to a reliable groundwater source. So, so it, this concept really uh, introduces some uh, pretty significant challenges when you're like NID in the area of origin. Um, final point, this, this is the, uh, many, many folks have probably heard of voluntary agreements. It's been uh, in the news for a number of years now. Uh, a voluntary agreement in concept would be an alternative to unimpaired flow. Um, so those discussions are ongoing. Uh, NID is, is a party to those discussions. They're confidential. It's subject to um, confidential, confidentiality and non-attribution agreements, as, as you might imagine, given the sensitive nature of the discussion. But um, this is where voluntary agreements would be slotted into this uh, discussion. The uh, final point is uh, the relicensing of your power project. Obviously, we don't, at least I don't know uh, when that will be issued, whether it's next year or five years or how, however many years from now. But uh, whenever that new license is issued, it uh, requires a number of uh, um, operational changes to your system. It requires uh, considerable investment in um, plans and gauging stations and all manner of, of improvements. Um, so there's a dollar price tag to the new license that's considerable. There's also a water cost that comes with the new license that is considerable because the new license will have um, enhanced in-stream flow obligations. So you will not be able to divert into storage or divert into uh, off-stream use um, uh, certain volumes of water that you can today under your year-to-year uh, -year FERC license. So I'll, uh, yes. yes. Quick question. Uh, so this is a mitigation and does not have a water right associated to it. It the is in in-stream flows, what is a mitigation for the FERC relicensing, but does not have a water right associated to it. That, well, I guess I'd say that's correct. This is a, a condition on your FERC license uh, to, to enhance in-stream flow at, at various locations throughout the district. Um, it is not a condition per se on your water rights. Uh, you have kind of two separate two separate permits. You have a power license, and then you have water right uh, water rights, various water rights. And this is a condition on your power license. Uh, but the real, I, I mean, the distinction doesn't really matter. You have to comply, um, and we will comply once the new new license is issued. But if the license goes away, so does the the mitigation. Maybe. I mean, if you're you're talking about a a decommissioning of a very large power project that uh, FERC in in the process of decommissioning a power project has the ability to impose conditions on that. So I don't know that that would be uh, that would be an unknown. I would say. Okay. Can we have one more follow-up question? Dustin, in regards, to, and I'm backing up real quick. So the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, we talk about the 45 to 65 percent unimpaired flows. Perhaps for clarity for those listening in, what does the state plan to do with those waters if they implement that regime? It would be uh, designated for in-stream use into the delta and then out the Golden Gate Bridge. So it would be protected against any kind of off-stream diversion. Thank you. This is, this is millions of acre feet, by the way. 45 to 65% unimpaired flow is millions of acre feet under the water board's analysis. So it's, uh, it's a, 
very significant water supply cost in an atmosphere of, you know, in climate change where we already have uncertainty about uh, the reliability of water supply. Justin, that would be for the whole state that never even mentioned. No. Just the it, North State. It, the Delta yeah. State. Just the President Beerwagon, they've yeah. divided. So this is just the Bay Delta water quality control plan, which Bay Delta is a huge watershed, right? But they've divided it into phases. Phase one was the San Joaquin tributaries. They're ahead of us in this process. They've already, um, the state water board has already imposed a, uh, let's see here. It's um, 30 to 50% unimpaired flow, I believe. I'd have to confirm those numbers, but They've, the water board has already amended the water quality control plan as to the San Joaquin tributaries to impose unimpaired flow. We are at phase two of that process um, where there, this framework document is proposing an amendment to the water quality control plan of 45 to 65% unimpaired flow, but they, the state water board has not taken that action yet. But the, but the millions of acre feet you listed are northern uh, phase two. Correct. Only not the whole state. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're at a really good stopping point. Otherwise, we'll be here for three more hours. <laughs> so we'll get this recalendared. Um, I have a note to myself for Mr. Macon and Ms. Booth to be recognized next time for additional questions they had. And then um, everybody think about all your questions. Anything else you want to know about? I know this is a really meaty topic, so board as well as public, please, I can't even talk about it. Please feel free to reach out if you want anything specifically addressed um, at the next meeting, and we can try and get that information together for you. And do we have a potential date for the next? Do you have one, something you want to suggest? Let me circle back up with staff. I just want to make sure the main players, right now we're looking at um, the meeting already planned for March, but let me oh, circle okay. back up and just make sure we have. Maybe we could do one sooner. We could potentially do one sooner. No. Unfortunately, February is a short month, so we kind of yeah. get squished up really quick. Yep. And then there's a holiday included in there. Yay. All righty. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Great job. Thank Thanks, you. Dustin. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Chip. And thanks for all who participated today. Yeah. It's been a great meeting. So we'll see you next time. Yeah. We didn't deserve it.